Under certain circumstances, there are few hours in life more agreeable than the hour dedicated to the ceremony known as afternoon tea. On this particular occasion, the implements of the little feast had been disposed upon the lawn of an old English country house in the perfect middle of a splendid summer afternoon. The shadows on the lawn were straight and angular. They were the shadows of an old man sitting in a deep wicker chair, and of two younger men strolling to and fro in desultory talk in front of him. The old man rested his eyes upon the rich red front of his dwelling. He would have been delighted to tell you that the house had a name and a history, how it had been built under Edward VI, had offered a night's hospitality to the great Elizabeth, and now, finally, had passed into the careful keeping of a shrewd American banker, who had bought it originally because it was offered at a great bargain, but who now, at the end of twenty years, had become conscious of a real aesthetic passion for it. The old gentleman was neatly dressed in well-brushed black, but a shawl was folded upon his knees. A beautiful collie dog lay near his feet, while a bustling terrier ran around the other gentleman. One of these was a remarkably well-made man of five and thirty, with a noticeably handsome face and a rich chestnut beard. His companion was a person of quite different pattern. Tall, lean, he had an ugly, sickly, witty, charming face. He looked clever and ill, and his gait had a shambling, wandering quality. Are you comfortable, Daddy? he inquired of the man in the chair. Well, I suppose I am in most respects. The old man smoothed his green shawl over his knees. The fact is, I've been comfortable for so many years that I suppose I've got so used to it I don't know it. Yes, that's the bore of comfort, said the third gentleman. We only know when we're uncomfortable. Were you ever sick, Lord Warburton? the old man asked. Lord Warburton considered a moment. Yes, sir, once in the Persian Gulf. He's making light of you, Daddy. He's sick of life. He was just telling me so. I told him he ought to take hold of a pretty woman. He's trying hard to fall in love, the young man added by way of explanation to his father. Well, you may fall in love with whomsoever you please, but you mustn't fall in love with my niece. I haven't the honor of knowing your niece, Mr. Touchett. She's a niece of my wife's. Then young Mr. Touchett explained... My mother has been spending the winter in America. She writes that she has discovered a niece and that she is bringing her to visit us. I see. Very kind of her. Is the young lady interesting? My mother has not gone into details. She chiefly communicates with us by means of telegrams, but she has not thoroughly mastered the art of condensation Tired America, hot weather, awful, return England with niece, first steamer, decent cabin. That was the last that came. Before that we had changed hotel, very bad, impudent clerk, taken sister's girl, died last year, go to Europe, two sisters, quite independent. Over that my father and I have scarcely stopped puzzling. And when does Mrs. Touchett arrive? The old man smiled. As soon as she can find a decent cabin, we presume. She likes to drop in on me suddenly. She thinks she'll find me doing something wrong. She has never done so yet, but she's not discouraged. While Lord Warburton talked to his father, Ralph Touchett wandered away towards the house, the little terrier at his heels. He was unaware that a young lady was stood in the doorway watching him. Ralph's attention was called to her when the dog suddenly darted forward, barking. Without hesitation, she stooped and caught him in her hands. His master now had time to follow, and to see that Bunchy's new friend was a tall, pretty girl in a black dress. The girl spoke to Ralph, smiling. 
Is this your little dog, sir? <laughs> he was mine a moment ago. Couldn't we share him? she asked, putting down the dog. I ought to tell you that I'm probably your cousin. Probably, the young man exclaimed, laughing. I supposed it was quite settled. Have you arrived with my mother? Yes, half an hour ago. She's gone straight to her room, and she told me that if I should see you, I was to ask you to go there at a quarter to seven. Thank you very much. I shall be punctual. Ralph looked at his cousin. You're very welcome here. She was gazing at the two gentlemen under the trees. Is one of those gentlemen your father? Yes, the one sitting down. The girl gave a laugh. I don't suppose it's the other. Who's the other? He's a friend of ours, Lord Warburton. Oh, I hoped there would be a lord. It's just like a novel. Won't you come and make acquaintance with my father? Ralph ventured to ask. He's old and infirm. He doesn't leave his chair. Oh, poor man, I'm very sorry, the girl exclaimed, immediately moving forward. I got the impression from your mother that he was rather, rather intensely active. Ralph Touchett was silent a moment. She hasn't seen him for a year. As they approached where old Mr. Touchett was sitting, he slowly got up from his chair to introduce himself. My mother has arrived, said Ralph, and this is Miss Archer. The old man gallantly kissed her. It's a great pleasure to see you here. The young lady looked around her again, at the lawn, the great trees, the beautiful old house. This is such a beautiful place. Is it Elizabethan? It's early Tudor, said Ralph. Early Tudor? How very delightful. There are many much better ones. Don't say that, my son, the old man protested, sitting down. I've got a very good one, said Lord Warburton, who as yet had not spoken. He slightly inclined himself, smiling. He had an excellent manner with women. The girl appreciated it in an instant. She had not forgotten that this was Lord Warburton. Ralph Touchett stood with his hands in his pockets, looking greatly as if he should like to renew his conversation with his newfound cousin. It's most unaccountable that we should never have known you, he said, by way of a beginning. Miss Archer hesitated. It was because there had been some disagreement between your mother and my father years ago after my mother's death, but my father died more than a year ago. After that, my aunt came to see me and proposed that I should come with her to Europe. So she has adopted you? Adopted me? The girl blushed. Oh, no, she has not adopted me. I'm not a candidate for adoption. I, I beg a thousand pardons, Ralph murmured. I meant... You meant she has taken me up. Yes, she likes to take people up, but... She added with a certain visible eagerness of desire to be explicit. I'm very fond of my liberty. Mrs. Touchett was certainly a person of many oddities. She was virtually separated from her husband, but she appeared to see nothing irregular in the situation. She lived most of her time in Florence, where she had bought a house, and left her husband to take care of the English branch of his bank. Mrs. Touchett indulged in no regrets, and usually came once a year to spend a month with her husband. At fixed intervals, she also paid a visit to her own country. She had taken up her niece. There was little doubt of that. One wet afternoon, some four months earlier than the occurrence lately narrated, this young lady had been seated alone with a book in the parlour of the house at Albany. Mrs. Touchett had appeared unannounced and stood in the doorway. I suppose you're one of the daughters? Isabel thought she had very strange manners. It depends upon whose daughters you mean. The late Mr. Archer's and my poor sister's. Ah said Isabel slowly. You must be our crazy Aunt Lydia. Is that what your father told you to call me? I'm your Aunt Lydia, but I'm not at all crazy. Which of the daughters are you? I'm the youngest, Isabel. 
Yes, the others are Lillian and Edith, and you must be the prettiest. And in this way, the aunt and the niece made friends. The aunt had quarreled years before with her brother-in-law after the death of her sister about the upbringing of his three girls. Being a high-tempered man, he had requested her to mind her own business, and she had taken him at his word. For many years, she held no communication with him. Isabel was surprised to find, however, that her aunt knew a great deal about them, and knew about the marriage of the two elder girls, knew that their poor father had left them very little money, but that the house in Albany was to be sold for their benefit. "'In Florence we should call this a very bad house,' said Mrs. Touchett, looking round. "'But here I dare say it will make a considerable sum for each of you.' "'I should very much like to go to Florence,' said Isabel thoughtfully. "'Well, if you'll be very good and do everything I tell you, I'll take you there.' Mrs. Touchett declared. Our young woman flushed a little and looked at her aunt. Do everything you tell me? I don't think I can promise that. No, you don't look like a person of that sort. And yet to go to Florence, the girl exclaimed in a moment, I'd promise almost anything. Well, I'll talk to your sister later. Isabel was restless and even agitated that evening. The importance of what had happened was out of proportion to its appearance. There had really been a change in her life. What it would bring with it was as yet extremely indefinite. But Isabel was in a situation that gave value to any change. As she sat thinking, the servant came in to announce Caspar Goodwood. He was a straight young man from Boston, who had known Miss Archer for a year and who thought her the most beautiful woman of her time. He had written that he might be visiting the area. Isabel had indeed been vaguely expecting him, looking forward to it. He was the finest young man she knew, and he was supposed by the world in general to wish to marry her. But now Isabel delayed some minutes, dazzled as she was by the immediate opening of her aunt's offer of Europe. When at last she presented herself, she found him standing by the fire. He was tall, strong, and rather obscurely handsome, with an angular jaw which is supposed to bespeak resolution. Isabel said to herself that it bespoke resolution tonight. In spite of which, in half an hour, Caspar Goodwood, who had arrived hopeful as well as resolute, returned to his hotel with a feeling of a man defeated. He was not, it may be added, a man weakly to accept defeat. Ralph Touchett knocked at his mother's door that evening with a good deal of eagerness. His father, as he had often said to himself, was the more motherly. His mother, on the other hand, was paternal. She was, nevertheless, very fond of her only child and insisted on his spending three months of the year with her. She embraced her son and inquired scrupulously about her husband's health and about the young man's own, and receiving no very brilliant account of either, 
remarked that she was more than ever convinced of her wisdom in not exposing herself to the English climate. Ralph had been very young when his father, Daniel Tracy Touchett, a native of Vermont, came to England as a partner in a banking house. Daniel Touchett saw before him a lifelong residence in his adopted country, but he had no intention of disamericanizing. Ralph was educated in America before spending three years in residence at Oxford. On leaving Oxford, Ralph had spent a couple of years traveling, after which he had joined his father's bank. But some 18 months later, he had become aware of his being seriously out of health. He had caught a violent cold, which fixed itself on his lungs. He had to give up work and apply to the letter, the sorry injunction to take care of himself. He was assured that he might outweather a dozen winters if he would betake himself to those climates in which consumptives chiefly congregate. As he had grown extremely fond of London, he cursed the flatness of exile. But he wintered abroad, as the phrase is, basked in the sun, stopped at home when the wind blew, went to bed when it rained, and once or twice, when it had snowed overnight, almost never got up again. And now tell me about the young lady, Ralph said to his mother. What do you mean to do with her? Mrs. Tutted was prompt. I mean to ask your father to invite her to stay some time at Garden Court. My father will ask her as a matter of course, said Ralph. But after that, what do you mean to do with her? After a short visit to Paris, I shall invite her to spend the autumn with me in Florence. But how do you two get on? Very well. I think I greatly amuse her. She's very frank and I'm very frank. We know just what to expect of each other. Dear mother, one always knows what to expect of you. You never surprise me but once, and that's today, in presenting me with a pretty cousin whose existence I had never expected. Do you think her so very pretty? Very pretty indeed. Who is this rare creature, and how did you make her acquaintance? I found her in an old house at Albany, boring herself to death. She didn't know she was bored, but when I left her no doubt of it, she seemed very grateful. You may say I shouldn't have enlightened her, but it occurred to me that it would be a kindness to take her about and introduce her to the world. You know I had seen nothing of my sister's children for years. I disapproved entirely of the father, but I always meant to do something for them when he should have gone to his reward. There are two others of them, both of whom are married, Lily, the elder, jumped at the idea of my taking an interest in Isabel. There was a little difficulty about the money question. Isabel seemed averse to being under pecuniary obligations, but she has a small income, and she supposes herself to be travelling at her own expense. Ralph had listened attentively to this judicious report. You've no plan of marrying her, he smiled. Marrying her? I should be sorry to play her such a trick. Anyway, she's perfectly able to marry herself. Do you mean to say she has a husband picked out? I don't know about a husband, but there's a young man in Boston. Isabel Archer was a young person who felt that she was very fortunate in being independent and that she ought to make some very enlightened use of that state. She had a friend whose acquaintance she had made shortly before her father's death, who offered so high an example of useful activity that Isabel always thought of her as a model. Henrietta Stackpole was thoroughly launched in journalism, and her letters to the interviewer from Washington, Newport, and other places were universally quoted. Isabel pronounced them with confidence ephemeral, but she esteemed the courage, energy, and good humor of the writer, who had, without property, adopted the children of a widowed sister and was paying their school bills. Henrietta's cherished desire had long been to come to Europe and write a series of letters to the interviewer from the radical point of view. When she heard that Isabel was coming, she hoped they might travel together, but she had been unable to get away. Henrietta, for Isabel, was chiefly a proof that a woman might suffice to herself and be happy. 
Even if one had not the journalistic talent of Henrietta, one was not, therefore, to conclude that one had no vocation and resign oneself to being frivolous and hollow. Isabel was stoutly determined not to be hollow. England was a revelation to Isabel, and she found herself as diverted as a child at a pantomime. Her uncle's house seemed a picture made real. No refinement of the agreeable was lost upon Isabel. The rich perfection of garden court had at once revealed a world and gratified a need. She formed a fast friendship with her uncle and often sat by his chair when he had had it moved out to the lawn. Isabel amused him more than she suspected, and he frequently gave himself the pleasure of hearing her chatter. Mr. Touchett used to think that she reminded him of his wife when she was young. She was fresh and natural and quick to understand, to speak. The old man was full of kindness for her. It was a long time, as he said, since they had had any young life in the house. He wanted to do something for her and wished she would ask it of him, but she asked nothing but questions. She questioned him immensely about England, about the British constitution, the English character, the manners and customs of the royal family, the peculiarities of the aristocracy, the way of living and thinking of his neighbours. The two amused themselves time and time again with talking of the attitude of the British public as if the young lady had some prior knowledge of it. But in fact, the British public remained for the present well away from Miss Isabel Archer, whose fortune had dropped her, to quote her cousin, into the dullest house in England. Her gouty uncle received very little company, and Mrs. Touchett, not having cultivated relations with her husband's neighbours, was not warranted in expecting visits from them. Ralph enjoyed his cousin's company a great deal. For many weeks he had been steeped in melancholy. He had grown anxious about his father, whose gout hitherto confined to his legs had begun to ascend to regions more vital. Ralph had always taken it for granted that his father would survive him. The father and son had been close companions, and at the prospect of losing his great motive, Ralph indeed lost his one inspiration. But Isabel's arrival even suggested there might be a compensation for the intolerable ennui of surviving his genial sire. He wondered whether he were harboring love for this spontaneous young woman from Albany, but he judged, on the whole, he was not. It devolved upon him, of course, to do the honours of the place. Mr. Touchett was confined to his chair, and his wife's position was that of a rather grim visitor. So that in the line of conduct that opened itself to Ralph, duty and inclination were harmoniously mixed. He was not a great walker, but he strolled in the grounds with his cousin, and in the long afternoons they took a boat on the river, or drove over the country in Mr. Touchett's phaeton. When they reached home, they usually found tea had been served on the lawn. But, for the most part, Mr. and Mrs. Touchett sat silent. One day, however, a visitor had arrived. The two young persons, after spending an hour on the river, strolled back to the house and perceived Lord Warburton in conversation. He had driven over from his own place and had been invited to spend the night. Isabel, seeing him for half an hour on the day of her arrival, had discovered in this brief space that she liked him. She had hoped she would see him again, hoped, too, that she would see a few others. Garden Court was not dull. The place itself was sovereign. Her uncle was more and more a sort of golden grandfather, and Ralph was a charming companion. But Isabel reminded herself that she was interested in human nature, and that her foremost hope in coming abroad had been that she should see a great many people. Lord Warburton was very attentive to our young heroine. During dinner that evening, he addressed many of his remarks to Isabel, who accepted this evidence of his esteem with a very good grace. She found herself liking him extremely. Mr. Touchett went to bed at ten o'clock, 
but his wife remained in the drawing room for some while. Eventually she rose and observed to Isabel that it was time they should bid the gentleman good night. I'll come up in half an hour, dear aunt. Ralph will light my candle, Isabel gaily engaged. Oh, do let me light your candle, Miss Archer, Lord Warburton exclaimed. Mrs. Touchett glared at him for a moment and then turned to her niece. You can't stay alone with a gentleman. You're not, you're not in your blessed Albany now. Isabel rose, blushing. I wish I were. Oh, I say, mother, Ralph broke out. My dear Mrs. Touchett, Lord Warburton murmured. I didn't make your country, my lord, Mrs. Touchett said majestically. I must take it as I find it. Ralph handed Isabel her candlestick. He had been watching her. It had seemed to him her temper was involved. But if he had expected anything of a flare, he was disappointed, for the girl simply laughed and nodded good night. Above stairs, the two ladies separated at Mrs. Touchett's door. Isabel had been silent on her way up. Of course you're vexed at my interfering with you, said Mrs. Touchett. But young girls here, in decent houses, don't sit alone with the gentleman late at night. You were very right to tell me then, said Isabel. I shall always tell you, whenever I see you taking what seems to me too much liberty. You're too fond of your own ways. Yes, I think I'm very fond of them, but I always want to know the things one shouldn't do. So as to do them, asked her aunt. So as to choose, said Isabel. Isabel was so devoted to Garden Court and its grounds that Lord Warburton ventured to express a hope that she would come some day to visit Lockley, his house. He extracted from Mrs. Touchett a promise that she would bring her niece there, and Ralph signified his willingness to attend the ladies. Lord Warburton assured our heroine that in the meantime his sisters would come and see her. The two Mrs. Molyneux, this nobleman's sisters, came presently to call upon Isabel and she really liked them. They were not in their first youth, but they had bright, fresh complexions and something of the smile of childhood. Their friendliness was great, though they seemed somewhat afraid of the young lady from the other side of the world. But they made it clear to her that they hoped she would come to luncheon at Lockley and that they might see her very often. They wondered if she wouldn't come over some day and sleep. They were expecting some people on the 29th, so perhaps she would come then. I'm afraid it isn't anyone remarkable, said the elder sister, but I dare say you'll take us as you find us. I shall find you delightful. I think you're enchanting just as you are, replied Isabel, who often praised profusely. It must be lovely to be so quiet and reasonable and satisfied, she told Ralph later. I should like to be like that. Heaven forbid, cried Ralph with ardour. I mean to try and imitate them, said Isabel. I want very much to see them at home. 
she had this pleasure a few days later, when, with Ralph and his mother, she drove over to Lockley. She found that she liked the Mrs. Molyneux even better at home than she had done at Garden Court. They made her feel so very welcome. When Lord Warburton showed her the house after luncheon, it seemed to Isabel a matter of course that it should be a noble picture. Within, it had been a good deal modernized, but as they saw it from the gardens, a stout, grey pile of the softest hue, rising from a broad, still moat, it affected the young visitor as a castle from a legend. The whole party were walking in the grounds, but Lord Warburton exercised some ingenuity in engaging Isabel in a stroll apart from the others. I'm very glad indeed you like the old barrack, he said. I wish you could see more of it, that you could stay here a while. My sisters have taken an immense fancy to you, if that would be any inducement. There's no want of inducements, Isabel answered. But I'm afraid I can't make engagements. I'm quite in my aunt's hands. Oh, I'm pretty sure you can do whatever you want. I'm sorry if I make that impression on you, but it's not true. It has the merit of permitting me to hope. Lord Warburton paused a moment. To hope what? That in the future I may see you often. Oh, to enjoy that pleasure I needn't be so terribly emancipated. I shall be very glad to see you. Oh, I'm charmed when you say that. You're easily charmed, my lord. No, I'm not easily charmed. And then he stopped a moment. But you've charmed me, Miss Archer. These words were uttered with an indefinable sound which startled the girl. It struck her as the prelude to something grave. I'm afraid there's no prospect of my being able to come here again, she said as gaily as possible. Never? I won't say never. I should feel very melodramatic. May I come and see you then next week? Most assuredly. What is there to prevent it? Nothing tangible. Is Mrs. Touchett going to take you abroad? I hope so. Is England not good enough for you? That's a very Machiavellian speech. It doesn't deserve an answer. I want to see as many countries as I can. Then you'll go on judging, I suppose. Enjoying, I hope, too. She paused. My aunt will soon wish to start. We've a long drive back. She turned back towards the others, and Lord Warburton walked beside her in silence. The day after her visit to Lockley, Isabel received a note from her friend Miss Stackpole, exhibiting the postmark of Liverpool. Here I am, my lovely friend, Henrietta wrote. I managed to get off at last. When can we meet? I suppose you're visiting at some castle or other and have already acquired the correct accent. Perhaps even you have married a lord. I almost hope you have, for I want some introductions to the first people. The interviewer wants some light on the nobility. Do appoint a meeting as quickly as you can. I've got something very particular to tell you. Isabel judged best not to show this letter to her uncle, but she acquainted him with its purport, and as she expected, he insisted she should invite Miss Stackpole to Garden Court. Though she's a literary lady, he said, I suppose that being an American, she won't show me up. She has seen others like me. She has seen no other so delightful, Isabel answered. But she was not altogether at ease about Henrietta's reproductive instincts, which belonged to that side of her friend's character which she regarded with least complacency. She wrote to Miss Stackpole, however, that she would be very welcome under Mr. Touchett's roof and this alert young woman lost no time in announcing her prompt approach. She took the train to the nearest station to Garden Court, where Isabel and Ralph were in waiting to receive her. Shall I love her or shall I hate her? Ralph asked while they waited on the platform. Whichever you do will matter very little to her, said Isabel. She doesn't care a straw what men think of her. As a man, I'm bound to dislike her, then. Is she very ugly? No, she's decidedly pretty. A female reporter in petticoats. 
I'm very curious to see her, Ralph conceded. You'll probably fall in love with her at the end of three days. And have my love letters published in the interviewer? Never, cried the young man. The train presently arrived, and Miss Stackpole promptly descended. She was a plump person, with a round face and short brown hair in ringlets, and peculiarly open, surprised-looking eyes. She spoke in a clear, loud voice. Yet after she had taken her place with her companions in Mr. Touchett's carriage, she struck Ralph as not at all the horrid type of person he had expected. She answered the inquiries made of her by Isabel with copious lucidity, and later, in the library at Garden Court, when she had made the acquaintance of Mr. Touchett, his wife not having thought it necessary to appear, did more to give the measure of her confidence in her powers. "'Well, I should like to know whether you consider yourselves American or English,' she broke out. "'If once I knew, I could talk to you accordingly.' "'Talk to us anyhow, and we shall be thankful.' Ralph liberally answered. Henrietta stared at him. I don't suppose that you're going to undertake to persuade me that you're an American. To please you, I'll be an Englishman. I'll be a Turk. Well, if you can change about that way, you're very welcome, Miss Tackpole returned. I'm sure you understand everything, and the differences of nationality are no barrier to you, Ralph went on. I'm not sure I understand you said the correspondent of the interviewer, but I expect I shall before I leave. He's what's called a cosmopolite, Isabel suggested. That means he's a little of everything and not much of any. I must say, I think patriotism is like charity. It begins at home. Ah, but where does home begin, Miss Stackpole? Ralph inquired. I don't know where it begins, but I know where it ends. It ended a long time before I got here. Don't you like it over here? asked Mr. Touchett with his aged, innocent voice. Well, sir, I haven't quite made up my mind what ground I shall take, but your surroundings seem very attractive. Miss Stackpole was evidently prepared to make a considerable stay at Garden Court. She occupied herself in the mornings with literary labor, but in spite of this, Isabel spent many hours with her friend. Isabel speedily found occasion to desire her to desist from celebrating the charms of their common sojourn in print, having discovered on the second morning of Miss Stackpole's visit that she was engaged on a letter to the interviewer, of which the title, in her exquisitely neat and legible hand, was Americans and Tudors, Glimpses of Garden Court. I don't think you ought to describe the place, protested Isabel. Why? It's just what the people want, and it's a lovely place. It's too lovely to be put in the newspapers. My uncle and cousin will consider it a breach of hospitality. Miss Stackpole sighed and put away her manuscript. Oh, of course, if you don't approve, I won't do it. But I sacrifice a beautiful subject. There are plenty of other subjects. We'll take some drives. I'll show you some charming scenery. Scenery's not my department. I always need human interest, Miss Stackpole rejoined. I was going to bring in your cousin, the alienated American. There's a great demand for that just now, and your cousin's a beautiful specimen. He would have died of the publicity, Isabel exclaimed. Well, I should have liked to kill him a little, and I should have delighted to do your uncle, who seems to me a much nobler type, the American faithful still. Isabel looked at her companion in much wonderment. My poor Henrietta, you've no sense of privacy. Henrietta colored deeply. You do me great injustice, she said with dignity. I've never written a word about myself. I'm very sure of that, but it seems to me one should be modest for others also. Oh, that's very good! cried Henrietta, seizing her pen again. Just let me make a note of that and I'll put it somewhere. She was a thoroughly good-natured woman and was soon in cheerful mood again. It was not apparent at the end of three days that Ralph had, according to Isabel's prophecy, lost his heart to their visitor, 
though he had spent a good deal of time in her society. They strolled about the park together, and in the afternoon, when it was delightful to float along the Thames, Miss Stackpole occupied a place in the boat in which hitherto Ralph had had but a single companion. Her presence proved somehow less irreducible to soft particles than Ralph had expected, for the correspondent of the interviewer prompted mirth in him, and he had long since decided that the crescendo of mirth should be the flower of his declining days. Henrietta, on her side, failed a little to justify Isabel's declaration with regard to her indifference to masculine opinion, for poor Ralph appeared to have presented himself to her as an irritating problem, which it would be almost immoral not to work out. Henrietta stayed at Garden Court for some days before she took occasion to say to Isabel, When I wrote you from Liverpool, I said I had something particular to tell you. Isabel, Mr. Goodwood came out in the steamer with me. Oh, Isabel responded. He has come after you. Did he tell you so? No, he told me nothing. That's how I knew it, said Henrietta cleverly. Isabel waited. At the mention of Mr. Goodwood's name, she had turned a little pale. He oughtn't to be encouraged, she said at last. Well, you encouraged him in the past. Isabel made for the moment as if to deny this charge, instead of which, however, she presently answered, It's very true. I did encourage him. And then she asked if her companion had learned from Mr. Goodwood what he intended to do. He said he meant to do nothing, Miss Stackpole answered, but I don't believe that. I expect him here any day. Our heroine was alarmed by this observation. For the next 48 hours, she stood prepared to hear the young man's name announced. Instead, however, a letter arrived for her. It bore the London postmark and was addressed in a hand she knew. She sat in the garden to read it. My dear Miss Archer, I am sure that my coming to England will scarcely be a surprise to you. You will remember that when you gave me my dismissal at Albany three months ago, I protested against it. You, in fact, appeared to accept my protest and to admit that I had the right on my side. Therefore, it is my belief you will let me see you again. I come to England simply because you are here. I couldn't stay at home after you had gone. May I not come and see you for half an hour? This at present is the dearest wish of yours faithfully, Caspar Goodwood. Isabel read this missive with such deep attention that she was unaware of someone approaching. Looking up, she saw Lord Warburton standing before her. Isabel smiled and put the letter into her pocket, exhibiting no trace of discomposure. They told me you were out here, said Lord Warburton. Isabel had got up. I was just going indoors. Please don't do that. It's a lovely day. His smile was peculiarly friendly and pleasing. We'll walk about a little then, said Isabel. Lord Warburton seemed prepared to do anything that Isabel would propose, but he was not in command of his emotions as he strolled beside her in silence. There was something embarrassed in his manner. 
I hope you had a pleasant ride from Lockley, said Isabel, who observed her companion's hesitancy. It would have been pleasant if for nothing else than it brought me here. Are you so fond of Garden Court? I care nothing for Garden Court, said her companion. I care only for you. But you've known me too short a time to have a right to say that. One's right in such a manner is not measured by the time, Miss Archer. It's measured by the feeling itself. Of course I've seen you very little, but my impression dates from the very first hour we met. I fell in love with you then. Nevertheless, I made up my mind to think it over. All these days I've done nothing else. I don't make mistakes about such things. When I'm touched, it's for life, Miss Archer. It's for life. Lord Warburton repeated in the kindest, tenderest voice Isabel had ever heard. He stopped and took her hand. Oh, Lord Warburton, how little you know me, Isabel said gently, drawing her hand away. Don't taunt me with that. That I don't know you better makes me unhappy enough already. You do like me, rather, don't you? I like you very much, Lord Warburton, she answered, and at this moment she liked him immensely. And I thank you more than I can say for your offer. Oh, don't say that, he broke out. It's I who ought to thank you for listening to me. And the way you've listened does give me some hope. Should you be greatly surprised if I were to beg you not to hope? Isabel asked. Surprised? It wouldn't be that. It would be a feeling much worse. Isabel walked on. She was silent for some minutes. You've given me a great deal to think about, she said eventually, and I promise to do it justice. That's all I ask of you, of course. But I must tell you that what I shall think about is some way of letting you know that what you ask is impossible, letting you know it without making you miserable. There's no way to do that, Miss Archer, Lord Warburton said gravely. I won't say that if you refuse me, you'll kill me. I shall not die of it, but I shall live to no purpose. He held out his hand, and she gave him hers a moment, a moment long enough for him to bend his handsome bare head and kiss it. Then, still agitating in his mastered emotion, he walked rapidly away. Isabel was upset, but she had not been affected as she would have imagined. She couldn't marry Lord Warburton. The idea failed to support any enlightened prejudice in favour of the free exploration of the life that she had hitherto entertained. But what disturbed her was that it cost her so little to refuse such a magnificent chance. Isabel decided to speak to her uncle about what had taken place. She wished to speak to someone and her uncle presented himself in a more attractive light than either her aunt or Henrietta. To tell her cousin was out of the question. She approached her point directly, as Mr. Touchett sat in the garden the next day. I think I ought to let you know that Lord Warburton has asked me to marry him. I have yet to tell my aunt. The old man expressed no surprise. Do you mind telling me whether you accepted him? I've not answered him definitely yet, but I shall not accept him. Well, of course an old man can't judge for a young lady, but he's a very fine young man. Don't you like him? I like him extremely, but I don't wish to marry anyone just now. Well, <laughs> fortunately ladies are not obliged to give reasons and I don't see why the English should want to entice us away from our native land. They already have a rather crowded country. However, I presume there's room for charming young ladies everywhere. There seems to have been room here for you, said Isabel. Mr. Touchett gave a shrewd smile. There's room everywhere, my dear, if you'll pay for it. I sometimes think I've paid too much for this. Perhaps you might also have to pay too much. Perhaps I might, the girl replied. The next day, Isabel wrote the following letter. 
My dear Lord Warburton, a great deal of earnest thought has not led me to change my mind about the suggestion you were so kind as to make to me the other day. I am not able to regard you in the light of a companion for life. We see our lives from our own point of view. That is the privilege of the weakest and humblest of us. And I shall never be able to see mine as mistress of Lockley. Please do me the justice to believe that I have given your proposal the deeply respectful consideration it deserves. I remain sincerely yours, Isabel Archer. While the author of this missive was making up her mind to dispatch it, Henrietta Stackpole had invited Ralph Touchett to walk with her in the garden. She informed him that she had a favour to ask of him. I want you to help me about Isabel. Has she injured you? Ralph asked. If she had, I shouldn't mind, but I'm afraid that she'll injure herself. I think that's very possible, said Ralph. His companion stopped and stared at him. The way you do say things! I never heard anyone so indifferent. To Isabel? Oh, not that. Well, if you really care for your cousin, here's an opportunity to prove it. I find her fearfully changed. She's not the bright American girl she was. She's taking different views and turning away from her old ideals. I want to save those ideals, Mr. Touchett, and that's where you come in. Not surely as an ideal. Well, I hope not, Henrietta replied promptly. I'm frightened she might marry one of those fell Europeans, and I want to prevent it. Oh, I see, cried Ralph. And to prevent it, you want me to step in and marry her? Not quite. That remedy would be as bad as the disease. No, I wish you to take an interest in a young man to whom she once gave great encouragement and whom she now doesn't seem to think good enough. He's a very dear friend of mine, and I wish very much you would invite him to pay a visit here. Ralph was puzzled by this appeal. Who's the gentleman you speak of? Mr. Caspar Goodwood of Boston. He has been extremely attentive to Isabel and has followed her to England. I've never heard of him. Well, I don't believe he's ever heard of you, but that's no reason why Isabel shouldn't marry him. Ralph gave a mild, ambiguous laugh. <laughs> Is she <laughs> very fond of him? If she isn't, she ought to be. And you wish me to ask him here, said Ralph reflectively. Yes. Will you do that? I don't know. Will my cousin be pleased to see him? Very possibly not, but it will be good for her. Three months ago, she gave Mr. Goodwood every reason to suppose he was acceptable to her. But I've never heard Isabel even mention his name, said Ralph. I really don't think I can ask him. Oh, just as you please, Henrietta returned. I had no idea you were in love with her yourself. Do you really believe that? The young man asked with lifted eyebrows. Of course I believe it, Miss Stackpole ingeniously said. Well, to prove to you that you're wrong, I'll invite him. It must be, of course, as a friend of yours. It will not be as a friend of mine that he'll come. And it will not be to prove to me that I'm wrong that you'll ask him, but to prove it to yourself. These last words of Miss Tackpole's contained an amount of truth which Ralph Touchett was obliged to recognize. But in spite of this, he wrote an invitation to Mr. Goodwood and waited in some suspense.
Two days after sending the invitation, Ralph received a short note from Caspar Goodwood, regretting that other engagements made a visit to Garden Court impossible. Ralph showed the note to Henrietta. I'm afraid he doesn't care so much about my cousin as you suppose, he observed. No, it's not that. It's some subtler motive. His nature's very deep. I shall write and find out what he means. Henrietta presently proposed to Isabel that they should make an excursion to London. To tell the truth, she observed, I'm not seeing much at this place. I've not even seen that aristocrat, what's his name, Lord Warburton. Lord Warburton's coming to lunch tomorrow, replied her friend. You can meet him then. Well, he may do for one letter, but I must go to London and get some impressions of real life. As Isabel had seen little of the British capital, she was happy at Henrietta's suggestion that the two should visit together. They thought they would stay at some picturesque old inn and drive over the town in a hansom. Isabel grew eager and presently unveiled the bright vision to Ralph, who burst into laughter. <laughs> it's a delightful plan. I'll have you put down at my club. Do you mean it's improper? Isabel asked. Dear me, isn't anything proper here? Henrietta has travelled over the whole American continent alone. Ah, then, said Ralph, let me take advantage of her protection to go up to town as well. <laughs> I may never have a chance to travel so safely. Lord Warburton arrived at Garden Court the following morning with his elder sister. He was introduced to Miss Stackpole and conversed with her, but he neither looked at Isabel nor spoke to her. After luncheon, the younger members of the party removed themselves to the picture gallery, and Isabel found herself standing with the owner of Lockley. I had hoped you wouldn't write to me that way, he said quietly. It was the only way, Lord Warburton. But do you prefer someone else? That's a question I'd rather not answer replied Isabel. Ah, you do, then, her suitor murmured with bitterness. You're mistaken, I don't. I can't even be glad of that, for that would be an excuse. Isabel raised her eyebrows. An excuse? Must I excuse myself? I can't escape my fate. Your fate? I should try to escape it if I were to marry you, and... I know it can't be my fate to give up. Do you call marrying me giving up? Not in the usual sense, but it's giving up other chances, said Isabel, trying to make her meaning clear, but she stopped as the others approached. Lord Warburton's sister timidly reminded him that they ought to return home as they were expecting company. You must come to Lockley again, Miss Molyneux said, turning to Isabel. I'm afraid I'm going away, replied Isabel. Oh, I'm so very sorry. I should like to see you at home, said Henrietta, whom Lord Warburton found beside him. There's a great many questions I wish to ask you. I shall be delighted to see you, Lord Warburton answered. Miss Archer and I are thinking of going to London, but we'll come and see you first. Miss Archer won't come to Lockley. She doesn't like the place. But she told me it was lovely. She's probably frightened of taking me because of what I might write. Lord Warburton was at a loss. He had not been made acquainted with Miss Stackpole's professional character. Miss Stackpole takes notes, Ralph explained, leading the party out of the gallery. She's a great satirist. Well, I must say I have never had such a collection of bad material, Henrietta declared. You were as dismal as if you had got a bad cable. Lord Warburton strolled beside Isabel with eyes lowered. Is it true you're going to London? Yes. And when shall you come back? In a few days, but then I'm going to Paris with my aunt. When then shall I see you again? Not for a while, said Isabel, but some day or other, I hope. Do you really hope it? Very much. He went a few steps in silence. Then he stopped and put out his hand. Goodbye. Goodbye, said Isabel. 
As Isabel returned to her room, she was met by Mrs. Touchett. I may as well tell you that your uncle has informed me of your relations with Lord Warburton. Relations? They're hardly relations. Why did you tell your uncle rather than me? Mrs. Touchett dispassionately asked. Because he knows Lord Warburton better. Yes, but I know you better. I'm not sure of that, said Isabel, smiling. Neither am I, after all, especially when you give me that rather conceited look. One would think you were awfully pleased with yourself and had carried off a prize. I suppose that when you refuse an offer like Lord Warburton's, it's because you expect to do something better. Oh, my uncle didn't say that, cried Isabel, smiling still. Ralph Touchett accompanied his visitors to town and established them in Pratt's Hotel, near Piccadilly. He stayed in his quarters in Winchester Square and began his day with an early visit to his fellow travellers. Over breakfast, the little party made out a scheme of entertainment for the day. They visited the British Museum, the National Gallery, Trafalgar Square, and Hyde Park. They walked in Kensington Gardens, where Isabel stopped the children, mainly of the poorer sort, whom she saw playing. She asked them their names and gave them each sixpence. Ralph noticed these quaint charities. He noticed everything she did, and a more contented man was nowhere at that moment to be found. His cousin had not yet seemed to him so charming as during these days spent in the metropolis. One afternoon, Ralph invited his visitors to tea in Winchester Square. There was another guest to meet them, an amiable bachelor, an old friend of Ralph's who happened to be in town. Mr. Bantling, a stout, smiling man of forty, wonderfully dressed, universally informed, and incoherently amused, laughed immoderately at everything Miss Tadpole said. And afterwards, when the host proposed they should go out into the square, he walked round the limited enclosure several times with her and bounded responsive to her remarks upon the inner life. Oh, I see. I dare say you found it very dull at Garden Court. Naturally, there's not much going on there when there's such a lot of illness about. Touch it's very bad, you know. The doctors have forbidden his being in England at all, and he's only come back to take care of his father. If you want a house where there's always something going on, I recommend you go down and stay with my sister, Lady Pencil in Bedfordshire. <laughs> I'll write to her tomorrow, and I'm sure she'll be delighted to ask you. I know just what you want. You want a house where they go in for theatricals and picnics and that sort of thing. My sister's just that sort of woman. She loves distinguished people and writers. <laughs> All this was very pleasant to Miss Stackpole, and she was sorry to be obliged to separate from Lady Pencil's brother. But she had met some friends from Delaware the day before, the Miss Climbers, and had agreed to dine with them in German Street at six o'clock. She prepared to depart, taking leave first of Ralph Touchett and Isabel, who were seated in another part of the enclosure. Ralph remarked that Henrietta must take a cab. Oh, don't tell me that it's improper for me to walk. I simply meant you'd be late for dinner, Ralph returned. Mr. Bantling offered to find a cab for Henrietta, and the two took their departure. And pray, what am I to do? Isabel asked, looking at Ralph. I don't imagine that you'll propose that you and I, for our amusement, shall drive about London in a hansom. There's no reason why we shouldn't stay here for a while if you don't dislike it. It's very warm, and if you permit it, I'll light a cigarette. You may do what you please, if you'll amuse me till seven o'clock. I propose at that hour to go back and partake of two poached eggs and a muffin at Pratt's Hotel. May I dine with you? Ralph asked. No, you'll dine at your club. Ralph lit his cigarette. Are you tired of me? I shall be an hour hence. You see, I have the gift of foreknowledge. Oh, I shall be delightful meanwhile, said Ralph. But he sat silent for some minutes before continuing. There's something I should very much like to ask you. Ask what you will. Well, then, I... Hope you won't mind my saying that Warburton has told me of something that has passed between you. Isabel suppressed a start. Did he ask you to talk to me? 
No. Then you are doing it disinterestedly or for the love of argument? I've no wish to argue with you, but why shouldn't I speak to you of this matter? What's the use of being your cousin if I can't have a few privileges? What's the use of adoring you without hope of reward if I can't have a few compensations? What's the use of being ill and restricted to mere spectatorship at the game of life if I really can't see the show when I've paid so much for my ticket? Tell me this. Ralph went on while Isabel stared at him. What had you in mind when you refused Lord Warburton? What dictated so remarkable an act? I just didn't want to marry him. I hardly know him. You're evidently disappointed, she added with rueful gentleness. Not in the least. If you've really given Warburton his final answer, I'm rather glad for my sake that it was what it was. Are you thinking of proposing to me? By no means. That would be fatal. I should kill the goose that supplies me with the material for my inimitable omelettes. <laughs> what I mean is, I shall have the thrill of seeing what a young lady does who won't marry Lord Warburton. I shall hang on the rest of your career. I shall not see all of it, but I shall probably see the most interesting years. But I don't see what harm there is in my not wishing to begin life by marrying. There are other things a woman can do. I'm sorry, I can't explain more. You've told me the great things, that the world interests you and that you want to throw yourself into it. Her eyes shone a moment in the dusk. I never said that. I think you meant it. Don't repudiate it. It's so fine. Ralph stood up and held out his arm and asked again if he mightn't dine with her. By no means, Isabel answered. You're very tired. You must go home and go to bed. When people forget I'm a poor creature, I'm often incommoded. But it's worse when they remember it. Isabel had no hidden motive in wishing Ralph not to dine with her. It simply struck her that for some days past she had consumed an inordinate quantity of his time. She had, moreover, a great fondness for intervals of solitude. However, seated towards nine o'clock in the dim illumination of Pratt's hotel and trying to read, she was interrupted by the waiter presenting her with a card bearing the name of Mr. Caspar Goodwood. Shall I show the gentleman up, ma'am? Isabel hesitated and then nodded. Caspar Goodwood was accordingly the next moment shaking hands with her. How did you know I was here? Isabel asked. Miss Stackpole let me know. She wrote me that you would probably be at home alone this evening. Henrietta never told me, said Isabel, motioning her guest to sit down. Is it so disagreeable to you to see me? Isabel made no reply. The sense of Henrietta Stackpole's treachery was strong within her. Henrietta's certainly not a model of all the delicacies, she exclaimed bitterly. The fault's mine as much as hers. 
I've been hoping every day for an answer to my letter. You might have written me a few lines. It wasn't the trouble of writing that prevented me. My silence was an intention, Isabel said. I thought that if you were capable of banishing me from your mind for a few months, we should be on good terms again. I'm capable of nothing with regard to you, said the young man, but just of being infernally in love with you. Think of me or not, as you find most possible. Only leave me alone. Until when? Well, for a year or two. Which do you mean? Between one year and two, there's all the difference in the world. Call it two, then, said Isabel. And what shall I gain by that? If you make the sacrifice, you'll have all my admiration. I don't care a cent for your admiration, with nothing to show for it. When will you marry me? That's the only question. Never, if you go on worrying me to death. Caspar Goodwood flushed. Isabel could see that her sharpness had at last penetrated. Why do you make me say such things to you? She cried in a trembling voice. I only want to be gentle, to be thoroughly kind. But I really don't want to marry or talk about it at all now. I've a perfect right to feel that way, and it's no kindness to a woman to urge her against her will. I think you had better go home. May I not see you again? I return in a day or two to my uncle's. I received an invitation to your uncle's more than a week ago, and I declined it. Isabel betrayed surprise. From whom was your invitation? From Mr. Ralph Touchett. I declined it because I had not your authorization to accept it. The suggestion appeared to come from Miss Stackpole. Henrietta really goes too far. Isabel gave a little shudder of dismay at the thought that Lord Warburton and Mr. Goodwood might have met at Garden Court. When you leave your uncle, where do you go? her companion asked. I'm travelling abroad with my aunt, to Florence and other places. So you simply want to travel for two years, said the young man. I'm quite willing to wait two years. If it interests you to see different countries, I shall be delighted to help you in any way in my power. You're very generous. That's nothing new to me. The best way to help me will be to put as many hundred miles of sea between us as possible. Well, then, I'll go home. But I'll come back wherever you are two years hence, the young man returned with characteristic grimness. Now, remember, I promise nothing, cried Isabel. You'll get very sick of your independence. Perhaps I shall. When that day comes, I shall be very glad to see you. But I must leave you now. She rose and opened the door and passed into the other room. She stood still a moment, listening, and at last she heard Caspar Goodwood walk out of the sitting room. Isabel was sitting reading when Henrietta Stackpole returned from her dinner. Has he been here, dear? Henrietta yearningly asked. You acted very wrongly, Henrietta. I acted for the best, and I trust you gave Mr. Goodwood some hope. I don't see why I should tell you anything, Henrietta. I can't trust you. But since you're so much interested, I won't conceal from you that Mr. Goodwood returns immediately to America. You don't mean to say you've sent him off, Henrietta almost shrieked. I asked him to leave me alone, and I ask you the same. Miss Stackpole glittered for an instant with dismay, and then took off her bonnet. Well, Isabel, if I didn't know you, I might think you were heartless. Henrietta then proceeded to tell her that she had determined not to return to Garden Court, but to await in London the arrival of the invitation that Mr. Bantling had promised would be sent from his sister, Lady Pencil. Henrietta felt sure that some time spent with Lady Pencil would be most productive, and told Isabel to look out for her impressions in the interviewer. Isabel was alone the following morning, when Ralph Touchett was announced. As soon as he came into the room, she could see that something was wrong. 
and he told her he was returning to garden court as his father had had an attack of his old malady. I have an appointment with the great doctor, Sir Matthew Hope, at twelve, and I will be catching the train at two-thirty. You can come with me or remain here a few days longer, exactly as you prefer. I shall certainly go with you, Isabel returned. I'm very fond of my uncle and I should like to be near him. That's very well. After his son, he's your greatest admirer. Isabel welcomed this assurance, but she gave secretly a small sigh of relief at the thought that Mr. Touchett was one of those admirers who couldn't propose to marry her. When Ralph returned at two o'clock, he found Miss Stackpole in the sitting room. She gave her condolences about his father and then voiced her concern about Isabel. What's her last misdemeanor? asked Ralph. Well... Mr. Goodwood was here last night. Ralph opened his eyes. He even blushed a little, a sign of an emotion somewhat acute. But he gave Miss Stackpole a diplomatic answer. I should have thought that with the views you expressed to me the other day, this would satisfy you perfectly. Well, it was all very well as far as it went. It was a little plot of mine. I let him know that we were in London, and then I sent him a word when he would likely find Isabel alone. Ralph's face lighted with relief. Henrietta went on. Well, he came to see her, but he might as well have stayed away. Isabel was cruel. I don't exactly know what passed between them, but she sent him back to America. Poor Mr. Goodwood. You don't say that as if you felt it. I don't believe you care. Ah, said Ralph, you must remember that I've never seen this interesting young man. Well, I shall see him, and I shall tell him not to give up. If I didn't believe Isabel would come round, Miss Stackpole added, well, I'd give her up. Ralph and Isabel made the journey to Garden Court in almost unbroken silence. They were met at the station by a servant who told them that Mr. Touchett's condition was unchanged. Ralph went to see his father, and Isabel went to her room. When after an hour she came downstairs in search of her aunt, she heard music coming from the salon. Thinking that this was Ralph, and that his anxiety about his father had been relieved, the girl made her way toward the source of the harmony. But the person seated at the piano was not Ralph. It was a lady unknown to Isabel. She played the piano remarkably well, with a discretion of her own. She looked up as Isabel approached. She was about forty years old, and not pretty, though her expression charmed. Pardon me, she said, but are you the niece, the young American? I'm my aunt's niece. That's very well. We're compatriots, said the lady, getting up, smiling. I'm very glad you've come back. I've heard a great deal about you. From whom have you heard about me? From your uncle. I've been here three days, and before he was taken ill, he talked of you constantly. As you didn't know me, that must have rather bored you. No, it made me want to know you. Mrs. Touchett appeared at this time and greeted her niece. Questioned about her husband, she was unable to say he was better, but they were waiting for Sir Matthew Hope. "'I suppose you two ladies have made acquaintance,' she pursued. "'If you haven't, I recommend you do so, as at the moment you're not likely to have much society about each other.' "'I know nothing about you but that you're a great musician,' Isabel said to the visitor. There's a great deal more than that to know, said Mrs. Touchett dryly. A very little of it, I'm sure, will content Miss Archer, the lady exclaimed with a light laugh. I'm an old friend of your aunt's. I've lived much in Florence. I'm Madame Merle. She's not a foreigner in spite of her name, said Mrs. Touchett. She was born on Brooklyn. Isabel looked at the visitor. She was a tall, fair woman with a classical look. She would have taken her for a German, a baroness, or a countess. 
Her manner expressed repose and confidence. It would never have been supposed that she had come into the world in Brooklyn. When Isabel came into the drawing room before dinner that evening, she found Ralph standing alone before the fireplace. Pray, who is this Madame Merle? she inquired. The cleverest woman I know, not excepting yourself. Is that why you invited her? I didn't invite her. I didn't know she was here. She's a friend of my mother's. She's the one person in the world whom my mother very much admires. Well, she's very charming, said Isabel, and she plays beautifully. She does everything beautifully. She's complete. Isabel looked at her cousin a moment. You don't like her. On the contrary, I was once in love with her. And she didn't care for you? How can we have discussed such things? Monsieur Merle was then living. Is he dead now? So she says. Don't you believe her? Yes. The husband of Madame Merle would be likely to pass away. But the discussion was interrupted by the arrival of the lady who was the topic of it. She came rustling in quickly, and Ralph offered her his arm with the exaggerated alertness of a man who was no longer a lover. Ralph returned to his father's room after dinner. The nurse had gone to supper, and he alone was in charge. Who is that with me? Is it my son? The old man asked. Yes, Daddy. And is there no one else? No one else. I want to talk a little. Won't it tire you? Ralph demurred. It won't matter if it does. I shall have a long rest. I want to talk about you. Ralph drew nearer to the bed. You had better select a brighter topic. You were always bright. I should like so much to think you'd do something. You'll be very well off. Yes, I know that. But it's impossible for a man in my state of health to spend much money. The best thing you can do when I'm gone is to marry. Ralph said nothing. He had foreseen what his father was coming to. This suggestion was by no means fresh. What do you think of your cousin? His father continued softly. At this, Ralph started. Do I understand you to propose that I marry Isabel? Don't you like her? Yes, very much. I like Isabel very much. Well, I know she likes you, and she would be good to you. I have thought a great deal about it. So have I, said Ralph. You are in love with her, then? No, I'm not in love with her. But I should be if... if certain things were different. I believe, on the whole, that people had better not marry their cousins, and that people in an advanced state of pulmonary disorder had better not marry at all. The old man raised his weak hand. 
but we're all each other's cousins, and if we stopped at that, the human race would die out. It's just the same with your bad lung. You're a great deal better than you used to be. All you want is to lead a natural life. It's a great deal more natural to marry a pretty young lady that you're in love with than it is to remain single on false principles. I'm not in love with Isabel, Daddy. I take a great interest in her, but not the sort of interest you desire. I shall not live many years, but I hope I shall live long enough to see her do something with herself. She wants to see the world, for instance. I should like to put a little wind in her sails and money in her purse. Ah, I've thought of that, said the old man. I've left her five thousand pounds. That's capital. But I should like you to do a little more. I should like you to give Isabel half of my inheritance. To do what she likes with? Absolutely. And without an equivalent of her marrying someone or other? It's just to do away with anything of that sort that I make my suggestion. If she has an easy income, she'll never have to marry for a support. She wishes to be free, and your bequest will make her free. But doesn't it occur to you that a young lady with so much money may fall victim to fortune hunters? That's a risk, but I think it's small, and I'm prepared to take it. But I don't see why you appeal to me. The money will be yours, and you can easily give it to her yourself. Ralph openly stared. Oh, dear father, I can't offer Isabel money. The old man gave a groan. Oh, don't tell me you're not in love with her. As Mrs. Touchett had foretold, Isabel and Madame Merle were thrown much together during the illness of their host, so that if they had not become intimate, it would have been almost a breach of good manners. Their manners were of the best, but in addition to this, they happened to please each other. Certainly, on the whole, Isabel had never encountered a more agreeable and interesting figure than Madame Merle. She was charming, sympathetic, intelligent, cultivated. She spent her days at Garden Court writing to her numerous acquaintances, painting or playing the piano. She was never idle, for when engaged in none of these ways, she was either reading, she appeared to Isabel to read everything important, or playing patience with the cards, or talking with her fellow inmates. She exhibited a great interest in Isabel's history, sentiments, opinions, prospects. She made her chatter and listened to her chatter with infinite good nature. Tell me more about America, she would often say to Isabel. You never tell me enough. Here I've been since I was brought here as a helpless child, and it's ridiculous how little I know about that splendid, dreadful, funny country. There are a great many of us like that in these parts, and I must say I think we're a wretched set of people. You should live in your own land. Whatever it may be, you have your natural place there. Oh, look at poor Ralph Touchett. Fortunately, he has a consumption. I say fortunately because it gives him something to do. You can say, Oh, Mr. Touchett, he takes care of his lungs. He knows a great deal about climates. But without that, what would he represent? Mr. Touchett, an American who lives in Europe. The worst case, I think, is a friend of mine, a countryman of ours who lives in Italy, and who is one of the most delightful men I know. Some day you must meet him. He's Gilbert Osmond. He lives in Florence. That's all one can say about him. He's exceedingly clever. But he has no career, no position, no fortune, no past, no future, no anything. Oh, yes, he paints. But he has a little girl, a dear little girl. If it were a career to be an excellent father, he'd be very distinguished. But tell me what they do in America, pursued Madame Merle, who, it must be observed parenthetically, did not deliver herself all at once of these reflections. Madame Merle did not remain to the end, as the issue of poor Mr. Touchett's malady had now come frankly to be designated. 
She was under pledges to other people which had at last to be redeemed, and she left Garden Court with the understanding that she should see Mrs. Touchett again before quitting England. Her parting with Isabel was even more like the beginning of a friendship than their meeting had been. I'm going to six places in succession, but I shall see no one I like so well as you, she said, kissing her. I've made a great exception for you. You must remember that and reward me by believing in me. Our young lady, after this, was much alone. She saw her aunt and her cousin only at meals. If I had foreseen this, I'd not have proposed your coming abroad now, Mrs. Touchett said to Isabel. I'd have waited until next year. But then I should never have known my uncle. That's very well, but it was not that you might know your uncle that I brought you to Europe. A perfectly voracious speech, but as Isabel thought, not as perfectly timed. She had leisure to think of this and other matters as she took a solitary walk every day. Among the subjects that engaged her attention were the adventures of her friend Miss Stackpole, with whom she was in regular correspondence. Henrietta's career, however, was not so successful as might have been wished. The invitation from Lady Pencil, for mysterious reasons, had never arrived, and poor Mr. Bantling had suggested that perhaps she should try a change of scene and write about French life. A few days later, Henrietta wrote that she had decided to go to Paris at the end of the week. She would wait in Paris until Isabel should arrive. Isabel communicated several passages from this correspondence to Ralph. It seems to me she's doing very well, he said, going over to Paris with an ex-lancer. If she wants something to write about, she has only to describe that episode. It's not conventional, certainly, Isabel answered. But if you mean that, as far as Henrietta is concerned, it's not perfectly innocent, you're very much mistaken. You'll never understand, Henrietta. Pardon me, I understand her perfectly. I'm afraid, however, that Bantling doesn't. He may have some surprises. Isabel was by no means sure of this, but she abstained from expressing further doubt. One afternoon, less than a week after Madame Merle's departure, Isabel was seated in the library reading. There was a great stillness in the house. It was so great that when she at last heard a soft, slow step on the carpet, she was almost startled by the sound. She looked up and saw Ralph Touchett standing there with his hands in his pockets, but with a face absolutely void of its usual latent smile. It's all over, said Ralph. Do you mean that my uncle... Oh, my poor Ralph, she gently wailed, putting out her two hands to him. Some fortnight after this, Madame Merle arrived in a handsome cab at the house in Winchester Square. Mrs. Touchett presently received her and intimated in a few words that condolences might be taken for granted. I know what you're going to say. He was a very good man. But I know it better than anyone, because I gave him more chance to show it. In that, I think I was a good wife, Mrs. Touchett added, that at the end her husband apparently recognized this fact. He has treated me most liberally. He has left me this house, but of course I shall sell it. As you know, my house in Florence is much better. Ralph, of course, has garden court, and he's naturally left very well off. But there's one remarkable clause in my husband's will, Mrs. Touchett added. He has left my niece a fortune. A fortune, Madame Merle softly repeated. Isabel steps into something like 70,000 pounds. Madame Merle clasped her hands. Oh, the clever creature. Mrs. Touchett gave her a quick look. What do you mean? For an instant, Madame Merle's colour rose. It certainly is clever to achieve such results without an effort, 
my dear friend, there assuredly was no effort. Isabel never dreamed, I'm sure, of my husband's doing anything for her. And what does Ralph think of it? He left for the Riviera before the will was read, used up by his fatigue and anxiety. But he's not in the least addicted to looking after number one. It depends upon whom he regards as number one, said Madame Merle. And she remained thoughtful a moment, her eyes bent. Am I not to see your happy niece? she asked at last. You may see her, but you'll not be struck with her being happy. She has looked so solemn these last three days. Isabel came in shortly, looking pale and grave. But the smile of her brightest moments came into her face as she saw Madame Merle. This lady went forward, and after looking at her for a moment, kissed her as she had at Garden Court. This was the only allusion the visitor, in her great good taste, made for the present to her young friend's inheritance. Mrs. Touchett had no intention of staying in London. She left the house to be disposed of by an auctioneer and took her departure for the continent. She was accompanied on this journey by Isabel, who now had plenty of leisure to weigh up the windfall on which Madame Merle had covertly congratulated her. The failure to rise to immediate joy was indeed but brief. The girl presently made up her mind that to be rich was a virtue because it was to be able to do. Just now, it is true, there was not much to do. Once she had sent off checks to Lily and Edith. But she was thankful for the quiet months which her aunt's fresh widow had compelled them to spend together. Mrs. Touchett rarely changed her plans, and having intended before her husband's death to spend the winter in Paris, saw no reason to deprive Isabel of this advantage. Though they would live in great retirement, she might still present her niece informally to the little circle of her fellow countrymen dwelling near the Champs-Élysées. With many of these amiable colonists, Mrs. Touchett was intimate. She shared their expatriation, their convictions, their pastimes. Isabel saw them arrive with a great deal of assiduity at her aunt's hotel. She made up her mind that their lives were, though luxurious, inane, and incurred some disfavor by expressing this view to her aunt. Mrs. Touchett thought this comment worthy of Henrietta Stackpole. The two ladies had found Henrietta in Paris, and Isabel constantly saw her. One of Mrs. Touchett's visitors was a young man with whom Isabel had a good deal of conversation. Mr. Edward Rosier was a native to New York, and had been brought up in Paris by his father, who, as it happened, had been a friend of the late Mr. Archer. He was a very gentle and gracious youth, with what are called cultivated tastes. He collected old china, Louis Quinze furniture, enamels and lace, and he frequented the best shops and hotels. He had once spent a couple of months in the United States, but considered Europe to be the place for a gentleman. Henrietta Stackpole thought him most unnatural and read him long lectures on the duties of an American citizen. 
Henrietta was at this time more than ever addicted to fine criticism, for her conscience had been freshly alarmed as regards Isabel. She had not congratulated this young lady on her augmentations and begged to be excused from doing so. If Mr. Touchett had consulted me about leaving you the money, she frankly asserted, I'd have said to him, never. I see, Isabel had answered. You think it will prove a curse in disguise? Perhaps it will. Leave it to someone you care less for. That's what I'd have said. Mrs. Touchett, before arriving in Paris, had fixed the day for her departure, and by the end of February had begun to travel southward. She interrupted her journey to pay a visit to her son, who had been spending the winter at San Remo. "'I want to ask you something,' Isabel said to this young man the day after her arrival. "'Did you know your father intended to leave me so much money?' Ralph gazed a little more fixedly at the Mediterranean. "'What does it matter, my dear Isabel, whether I knew?' "'So you did know?' "'Yes, he told me.' "'What did he do it for?' she asked abruptly. "'Why is a kind of compliment on your so beautifully existing?' He liked me too much. Oh, that's a way we all have. If I believed that, I should be very unhappy. Do you think it good for me suddenly to be made so rich? Henrietta doesn't. Oh, hang Henrietta, said Ralph coarsely. If you ask me, I'm delighted at it. Is that why your father did it? For your amusement? I differ with Miss Stackball, Ralph went on more gravely. I think it very good for you to have means. Isabel stared at him. I wonder whether you know what's good for me, or whether you care. If I know, depend upon it, I care. But don't ask yourself so much whether this or that is good for you. Live as you like best. Most things are good for you. The exceptions are very rare, and a comfortable income's not one of them. Ralph paused, smiling. Spread your wings. Rise above the ground. But a large fortune means freedom, and I'm afraid of that. It's such a fine thing, and one should make such a good use of it. But it's a constant effort. I'm not sure it's not a great happiness to be powerless. For weak people, I've no doubt it's a great happiness. And how do you know I'm not weak? Isabel asked. Ah, Ralph answered with a flush that the girl noticed. If you are, I'm awfully sold. In early May, some six months after old Mr. Touchett's death, a small group was gathered in one of the many rooms of an ancient villa crowning an olive-muffled hill outside Florence. In an apartment, one of the several into which the villa was divided, a gentleman was seated in company with a young girl and two good sisters from a religious house. The apartment was luxuriously furnished, with faded hangings of damask and tapestry, chests and cabinets of carved and time-polished oak, and deep, well-padded chairs. There were books in profusion, and a few small, elaborate pictures, chiefly in watercolour. One of these productions stood on an easel before which the young girl had placed herself. The gentleman was conversing with the two nuns, but at the same time his eyes rested gravely on the slim, small figure of their quiet charge. He was a man of forty, with an extremely modelled and composed face and a fair waxed moustache that suggested he was a gentleman who studied style. "'Well, my dear, what do you think of the painting?' he asked the young girl. "'It's very pretty, Papa. Did you make it yourself?' Certainly I made it. Don't you think I'm clever? Yes, Papa, very clever. She smiled sweetly at her father. Why don't you go and pick some flowers for the good ladies? The child turned to the elder of the sisters. May I, Mama Catherine? Obey, Monsieur, your father, my child, said the sister, blushing. The child, satisfied with this authorization, descended into the garden and was lost from sight. You don't spoil them, said her father gaily. For everything they must ask leave, that's our system. I've no doubt it's excellent. I sent my daughter to you to see what you'd make of her, and now at fifteen she seems to me very gentil. 
We love her very much, said the sister. We shall be sorry to lose her. It's not certain you'll lose her. Nothing's settled yet, their host rejoined quickly. I wish you could keep her always. Oh, monsieur, said the elder sister, getting up. Good as she is, she's made for the world. At this point, the young girl returned with two large bunches of roses. They will soon die, she cried. I wish I could give you something that would last. You've given us a good memory of yourself, my daughter. That will last. Their host, while the sisters exchanged kisses with his daughter, went forward to open the door to the antechamber, but as he did so, he gave a slight exclamation. A lady had just been admitted by a servant. The lady went into the room and found herself confronted with the two nuns and their pupil. The young girl gave a soft cry. Oh, Madame Merle. The visitor had been slightly startled, but her manner was nonetheless gracious. Yes, it's Madame Merle, come to welcome you home. This lady's a great friend of ours, the host told the sisters. You will have seen her at the convent. She'll help me to decide whether Pansy shall return to you at the end of the holidays. I hope you'll decide in our favour, madame. That's Mr. Osmond's pleasantry, replied Madame Merle. I decide nothing. The sisters embraced Pansy and then followed Mr. Osmond to the door. Pansy made to follow, but Madame Merle called to her. Stay with me, dear child while your father shows the good ladies to their carriage. Pansy stared, disappointed yet not protesting. She was evidently impregnated with the idea of submission, which was due to anyone who took the tone of authority. Shall you miss Mother Catherine? Madame Merle asked. Yes, when I think of her. Try then not to think of her. Perhaps some day you'll have another mother. I don't think that's necessary, Pansy said. I had more than thirty mothers at the convent. As she heard her father returning, she moved toward the door. Why didn't you come and see the last of Mama Catherine? Mr. Osmond asked abruptly. Pansy hesitated, glancing at Madame Merle. I asked her to stay with me. Ah, that was better. Osmond conceded, and he dropped into a chair. Why don't you go into the garden, little one, and pluck a flower or two for Madame Merle? That's just what I wanted to do, Pansy exclaimed. When the child left the room, Osmond addressed himself to his companion. You're looking particularly well. I think I always look the same, said Madame Merle. You always are the same. You're a wonderful woman. Yes, I think I am. But why are you here? Osmond asked. I've come to Florence to meet some friends who have lately arrived. That reason's characteristic. You're always doing something for your friends. I'd like to do something for you, said Madame Merle, looking at him with a certain courage. There's a friend of mine I should like you to meet. What good will it do me? Madame Merle smiled. It will amuse you. Who then is your friend? She's a niece of Mrs. Touchett. A niece? The word suggests youth and ignorance. Yes, she's young, 23 years old. I met her for the first time in England several months ago. I like her immensely, and you'll do the same. Is she beautiful, clever, rich, universally intelligent, and unprecedentedly virtuous? It's only on those conditions that I care to make her acquaintance. Miss Archer fills all your requirements. More or less, of course. No, quite literally. She's beautiful, accomplished, generous, and for an American, well-born. She also has a handsome fortune. Mr. Osmond listened to this in silence, his eyes on his informant. Come and see me this week continued Madame Merle. I'm staying at Mrs. Touchett's, Palazzo Crescentini, and the girl will be there. Did you say she was rich? She has 70,000 pounds. 
satisfactory woman. I mean you. <laughs> and did you say she has looks? Yes, but I won't say it again lest you be disappointed. Come and make a beginning. That's all I ask of you. A beginning of what? Madame Merle was silent a little. I want you, of course, to marry her. The beginning of the end. Well, I'll see for myself. Madame Merle, who had come to Florence on Mrs. Touchett's arrival and was staying at Palazzo Crescentini, spoke to Isabel afresh about Gilbert Osmond. She spoke of her old friend as one of the cleverest and most agreeable men, well, in Europe, simply. He wasn't a professional charmer, far from it. But if he cared or was interested, then one felt his cleverness and his distinction. At any rate, one shouldn't attempt to live in Italy without making a friend of Gilbert Osmond. For the moment, though, Isabel was happy just to be in Florence, and Ralph found it a joy that renewed his own early passion to act as a guide to his eager young kinswoman. In the clear May mornings before the formal breakfast, this repast at Mrs. Touchett's was served at twelve o'clock, Isabel wandered with her cousin through the narrow and somber Florentine streets. She went to the galleries and palaces. She looked at the pictures and statues that had hitherto been great names to her. She performed all those acts of mental prostration in which, on a first visit to Italy, youth and enthusiasm freely indulge. Gilbert Osmond came to see Madame Merle, who presented him to Isabel. The young lady took on this occasion little part in the talk. Mrs. Touchett was not present, and these two had it, for the effect of brilliancy, all their own way. They talked of the Florentine, the Roman, the cosmopolite world, and might have been distinguished performers figuring for charity. Isabel made no attempt to join in. There was something in the visitor that checked her and held her in suspense. Yet before he went, she had to speak. Madame Merle, he said, consents to come to my hilltop next week and drink tea in my garden. It would give me much pleasure if you would come with her. The view is considered rather good, and I have many paintings, and I should be so happy if you could know my daughter. Isabel replied that she would be pleased to accompany Madame Merle. Upon this assurance, the visitor took his leave, after which Isabel fully expected her friend would scold her for having been so stupid. But to her surprise, that lady said, You were so charming, my dear. These words caused Isabel the first feeling of displeasure she had known this ally to excite. That's more than I intended, she answered coldly. I'm under no obligation that I know of to charm Mr. Osmond. Madame Merle perceptibly flushed. My dear child, I didn't speak for him, poor man. I spoke for yourself. I thought you liked him. I did, said Isabel honestly. 
But I don't see what that matters either. Everything that concerns you matters to me, Madame Merle returned with her weary nobleness. Whatever Isabel's obligations may have been to Mr. Osmond, she found them sufficient to ask Ralph sundry questions about him. Do I know him? said her cousin. Oh, yes, I know him, but not well. I've never cultivated his society, and he apparently has never found mine indispensable to his happiness. He's a vague, unexplained American who has lived here some thirty years. I don't know his family, his origin. He used to live in Rome, but I remember hearing him say that Rome had grown vulgar. He has a great dread of vulgarity. That's his special line. He hasn't any other that I know of. He lives on his income, which I suspect of not being vulgarly large. He married young and lost his wife, and I believe he has a daughter. He also has a sister who's married to some small count or other. She's nicer than him, but rather impossible. I don't think I recommend you know her. But why don't you ask Madame Merle about these people? I want your opinion as well as hers, and I've promised to pay him a visit. To pay him a visit? To see his view, his pictures, his daughter. Madame Merle's to take me. Oh. With Madame Merle, you may go anywhere, said Ralph. She knows none but the best people. Isabel said no more about Mr. Osmond, but she presently remarked to her cousin that she was not satisfied with his tone about Madame Merle. I speak of Madame Merle exactly as I speak to her, with an even exaggerated respect. Exaggerated, precisely. That's what I complain of. But Madame Merle's merits are exaggerated. She's too good, too clever, too learned, too everything. I confess to you that she acts on my nerves. Isabel looked hard at her cousin, and then she asked him if he knew anything that was not to the honor of her brilliant friend. Nothing. Nothing whatever. And don't you see that's just what I mean? She's just too perfect. That's why I like her so much. Well, since you wish to see the world, you couldn't have a better guide. I suppose you mean by that that she's worldly. Worldly? No, said Ralph. She's the great round world itself. Isabel's visit to Mr. Osmond's hilltop took place on a soft afternoon in the full maturity of the Tuscan spring. The companions drove out of the Roman gate and wound through the blossoming orchards until they reached the villa. Mr. Osmond met them and ushered Isabel with her conductress into the apartment. While Isabel talked a little with their host, Madame Merle went forward familiarly and greeted two persons who were seated in the salon. One of these was Pansy. The other was a lady whom Mr. Osmond indicated to Isabel as his sister, the Countess Gemini. Pansy made Isabel a little conventional curtsy. The Countess Gemini simply nodded without getting up. Isabel could see she was a woman of high fashion. Her attire was bristling with elegance, and she had the most affected manner. It's only because I knew you were visiting today that I came myself. I don't often come to see my brother. I make him come and see me. <laughs> this hill of his is impossible. Possible. Really, Osmond, you'll be the ruin of my horses some day. But don't sit there, she said, directly addressing Isabel. That chair's not what it looks. There are some very good seats here, but there are also some horrors. I don't see any horrors anywhere, Isabel returned, looking about her at the paintings and ornaments. Everything seems to me beautiful and precious. I've a few good things, Mr. Osmond allowed. Indeed, I've nothing very bad, but I've not what I should have liked. You'd have liked a few things from the Uffizi and Pitti. That's what you'd have liked, said Madame Merle. Mr. Osmond had not heard her. He seemed to be thinking of what he could say to Isabel. Uh, won't you have some tea? You must be very tired he said at last. I'm not tired. What have I done to tire me? 
Isabel felt a certain need of being very direct. You'll be tired when you go home if he shows you all his knickknacks and gives you a lecture on each, said the Countess Gemini. I'm not afraid of that. At least I shall have learned something. Very little, I suspect. But my sister's afraid of learning anything, said Gilbert Osmond, sitting down beside Pansy. Mr. Osmond talked of many things. Madame Merle had said he could be agreeable when he chose, and today, after a little, Isabel felt he appeared not only to have chosen, but to have determined. He talked of Florence, of Italy, of its cultures, of the pleasure of living in that country. Eventually, Madame Merle proposed to the Countess Gemini that they should go into the garden. Isabel had got up on the assumption that they too were to go into the garden, but her host stood there with no apparent inclination to leave the room, his hands in the pocket of his jacket and his daughter clinging to his arm. Isabel waited with a certain unuttered contentedness to have her movements directed. She liked Mr. Osmond's talk, his company. She had what always gave her a very private thrill, the consciousness of a new relation. He moved across to one of the pictures and related some curious facts about it. She looked at the other works of art, and he gave her such further information as might appear most acceptable to a young lady making a call on a summer afternoon. His pictures, his medallions and tapestries were interesting, but after a while Isabel felt the owner much more so. He resembled no one she had ever seen. He was a specimen apart. It was not so much what he said and did, but rather what he withheld. Tea was served in the garden, and Pansy was sent to assist in the preparation. As Isabel had not yet been made acquainted with the view, Mr. Osmond directed her steps into the garden without more delay. The sun had got low, and the golden light took a deeper tone on the mountains. The scene had an extraordinary charm. You seem so pleased that I think you can be trusted to come back, Osmond said, as he led his companion to one of the angles of the terrace. Although Madame Merle spoke of your having some plan of going around the world. <laughs> I'm rather ashamed of my plans. I make a new one every day. I don't see why you should be ashamed. It's the greatest of pleasures, he said, smiling. The Countess Gemini, sitting with Madame Merle, watched as her brother stood on the terrace talking to Isabel. My dear, she then observed to her companion, you'll excuse me if I don't congratulate you. Very willingly, for I don't in the least know why you should. Haven't you a little plan that you think rather well of? And the Countess nodded at the sequestered couple. Madame Merle's eyes took the same direction. Then she looked serenely at her neighbor. You think me more calculating than I am. I'm not sure of that. You're capable of anything, you and Osmond. I don't mean Osmond by himself, and I don't mean you by yourself. But together you're dangerous, like some chemical combination. <laughs> you had better leave us alone, then smiled Madame Merle. I don't see what has got into your head. I've seen this girl but once, but I like her. Madame Merle hesitated a moment. I don't think she likes you. The Countess's face was set in a grimace. Oh, you are dangerous, even by yourself. If you want her to like you, don't abuse your brother to her, said Madame Merle. I don't suppose you pretend she has fallen in love with him in two intervals. Madame Merle looked a moment at Isabel and at the master of the house. He was leaning against the parapet, facing her, his arms folded. And she, at present, was evidently not lost in the mere impersonal view, persistently as she gazed at it, while listening to him. Yes, I think so she pronounced.
Gilbert Osmond came to see Isabel again. That is, he came to Palazzo Crescentini. Mrs. Touchett noted the fact that in the course of a fortnight he called five times. When she observed to Ralph that it was plain what Mr. Osmond was thinking of, Ralph replied that he was quite of her opinion. I trust she won't have the folly to listen to him, Mrs. Touchett said to her son, to which Ralph replied that Isabel's listening was one thing and Isabel's answering quite another. Mrs. Touchett also expressed her fears to Madame Merle. You who know everything must know whether that curious creature's really making love to my niece. Gilbert Osmond? Madame Merle widened her eyes. Heaven help us! That's an idea. Hadn't it occurred to you? You make me feel like an idiot, but I confess it hadn't. Well, I shall ask Isabel, said Mrs. Touchett. Madame Merle reflected. Don't be too quick with her. Don't inflame her imagination. I never did anything in life to anyone's imagination. But Mr. Osmond has nothing the least solid to offer. Madame Merle smiled. He's a man who in favorable conditions might very well make a great impression. Precisely why I wish he would cease his visits, cried Mrs. Touchett. At Palazzo Crescentini, Mr. Osmond's manner remained the same, diffident at first, oh, self-conscious beyond doubt, and full of the effort to overcome this disadvantage, an effort which usually resulted in a great deal of easy, lively, very positive, rather aggressive, always suggestive talk. Henrietta Stackpole arrived in Florence in the middle of May. Madame Merle surveyed her with a single glance, and after a pang of despair determined to endure her. Henrietta was joined by Mr. Bantling, who arrived from Nice. After an emotional reunion with Henrietta, this gentleman candidly confessed in private to Ralph Touchett that he liked Miss Stackpole extremely. He thought she had a wonderful head on her shoulders, and he found great comfort in the society of a woman who did not perpetually care about what she did or what would be said about her. Henrietta's prospects had brightened since leaving England, and she had sent many letters to the interviewer. She had spent two months in Venice, and her present purpose was to get down to Rome. Mr. Bantling was to go with her, and Ralph had the happy idea of proposing to Isabel that she also, under his own escort, should make the pilgrimage. Isabel, in truth, needed no urging, and the party of four arranged its little journey. One of Isabel's preparations consisted of her seeing Gilbert Osmond before she departed. I should like to be in Rome with you, he commented. She scarcely faltered. You might come then. But you'll have a lot of people with you. Ah, oh, Isabel admitted, of course I shall not be alone. For a moment he said nothing more. If I were to go, what should I do with my little girl? Bring her with you, said Isabel promptly. Mr. Osmond looked grave. She is too young to make journeys of pleasure. You don't like to bring her forward, Isabel inquired. No, I think young girls should be kept out of the world. I was brought up on a different system. You? Oh, oh, with you it succeeded because you, you were exceptional. I don't see why, said Isabel, who, however, was not sure there was not some truth in the speech. After Isabel had left Florence, Gilbert Osmond met Madame Merle at the Countess Gemini's. She wants me to go to Rome while she is there. Osmond remarked in a low voice. I suppose you mean that you proposed it and she assented. Of course, I gave her a chance, but she's encouraging. She's very encouraging. I rejoice to hear it, but don't pretend you don't enjoy it. The girl's not disagreeable, Osmond quietly conceded. Is that all you can find to say about that fine creature? All? Oh, 
Isn't it enough? I like her very much. She's all you described her, and into the bargain capable, I feel, of great devotion. She has only one fault. What's that? Too many ideas. I warned you she was clever. Fortunately, they're bad ones, said Osmond. Why is that fortunate? Naturally, if they must be sacrificed. Isabel's impression of Rome was such as might have been expected of a person of her freshness and her eagerness. She had always been fond of history, and here was history in the stones of the street and the atoms of the sunshine. By her own measure, she was very happy. She would even have been willing to take these hours for the happiest she was ever to know. The friends had gone one afternoon, it was the third of their stay, to look at the excavations in the forum. Henrietta wandered away with Mr. Bantling, whom it was apparently delightful to her to hear speak of Julius Caesar as a cheeky old boy, and Ralph addressed such elucidations as he was prepared to offer to the attentive ear of our heroine. One of the humble archaeologists who hover about the place had put himself at the disposal of the two, and he told them of a new digging that was on view nearby. Isabel was weary with much wandering, but she persuaded her companion to satisfy his curiosity while she rested. But she was not alone for long. She looked up and saw a gentleman, a gentleman who was not Ralph come back to say that the excavations were a bore. This personage was as startled as she was startled. Lord Warburton, Isabel exclaimed as she rose. Miss Archer, I had no idea it was you. She looked about her to explain. My cousin's gone to look at the work over there. Ah, oh, I see, said Lord Warburton vaguely. I'm alone. I had no idea you were in Rome. I've only just arrived from the east. You've been making a long journey, said Isabel, who had learned from Ralph of Lord Warburton's travels. Yes, I came abroad for six months, soon after I saw you last. I've been in Turkey and Asia Minor. He managed not to be awkward, but he wasn't easy. Do you wish me to leave you? I don't wish you to leave me, Lord Warburton. I'm very glad to see you. Thank you for saying that. He repeated more than once that he had not expected to meet her. I've written to you several times. Written to me? I've never had your letters. I never sent them. I burned them up. Ah! laughed Isabel. It was better that you should do that than I. I thought you wouldn't care for them, he went on, with a simplicity that touched her. I should have been very glad to have news of you. You know how I hope that... that... But she stopped. There would be such a flatness in the utterance of her thought. Let's not talk of all that. They walked along a little way in silence. Lord Warburton made for the moment no further reference to their great question, but resumed the conversation by telling Isabel about his travels. On her mentioning the limit of her stay in Rome, he declared he was glad it was still so distant. But you won't like that, he said. You'll be afraid you'll see too much of me. Well, I certainly can't expect you to leave this delightful place on my account, but I confess I'm afraid of you. Afraid I'll begin again? I promise I'll never say a word to displease you. Very good. If you do, our friendship's at an end. Perhaps some day, after a while, you'll give me leave. Give you leave to make me unhappy? He hesitated. To tell you again... But he checked himself. I'll keep it down. I'll keep it down always. Ralph Touchett had been joined at the excavation by Miss Stackpole and her attendant, and these three now emerged from among the mounds of earth and came into sight of Isabel and her companion. Poor Ralph hailed his friend with joy qualified by wonder, and Henrietta exclaimed in a high voice, Gracious! There's that lord! 
Mr. Bantling took occasion to nod to his lordship, who answered him with a friendly, Oh, you here, Bantling? and a handshake. Well, said Henrietta, I didn't know you knew him. I guess you don't know everyone I know, Mr. Bantling rejoined facetiously. I thought when an Englishman knew a lord, he always told you so. The next day was Sunday, and it had been agreed among our friends that they would drive together to the great church of St. Peter's for Vespers. The church was crowded when they arrived, but the service had not yet begun. Ralph and Henrietta became separated, and Isabel found herself following Lord Warburton. Suddenly, Gilbert Osmond appeared at her side. So you decided to come, she said, stopping and putting out her hand. Yes, I came last night. I called this afternoon at your hotel, and they told me you'd come here. The others are about, she decided to say. I didn't come for the others. She looked away. Lord Warburton was watching them. Perhaps he had heard this. Fortunately, at this moment, Mr. Bantling emerged, cleaving the crowd with British valour, and followed by Miss Stackpole and Ralph Touchett. Ralph appeared disturbed on seeing the gentleman from Florence. He didn't hang back, however, from civility, and presently observed to Isabel with due benevolence that she would soon have all her friends about her. Miss Stackpole had met Mr. Osmond in Florence, but she had already found occasion to say to Isabel that she liked him no better than her other admirers. Lord Warburton joined Ralph Touchett, and the two strolled away together. Who's the fellow speaking to Miss Archer? His name's Gilbert Osmond. He lives in Florence, Ralph said. Does she like him? Do you mean will she accept him? Yes, said Lord Warburton after an instant. I suppose that's what I horribly mean. Perhaps not, if one does nothing to prevent it, Ralph replied. His lordship stared a moment, but apprehended, Then we must be perfectly quiet? As quiet as the grave. Is he awfully clever? Awfully. And what else? What more do you want? Ralph groaned. Do you mean, what more does she? Ralph took him by the arm to turn him. They had to rejoin the others. She wants nothing that we can give her. Oh, well, if she won't have you, said his lordship handsomely. The following evening, Lord Warburton went to see his friends at their hotel, but was told they had gone to the opera. He drove to the opera with the idea of paying them a visit in their box after the easy Italian fashion. On gaining his admittance during a recess, he scanned two or three tiers of boxes and perceived in the largest a lady whom he easily recognized. Miss Archer was seated facing the stage, and beside her was Mr. Gilbert Osmond. They appeared to have the place to themselves, 
and Warburton supposed their companions were enjoying refreshments. As he made his way up the stairs, he met Ralph Touchett slowly descending. I was coming down to meet you, was Ralph's greeting. I feel lonely and want company. You've some that's very good, which you've yet deserted. Do you mean my cousin? Oh, she has a visitor and doesn't want me. Then Miss Stackpole and Bantling have gone out to a cafe to eat an ice. I didn't think they wanted me either. The opera's very bad, and I feel very low. You had better go home, Lord Warburton said without affectation. And leave my young lady in this sad place? Oh, no, I must watch over her. If she doesn't want you, she won't want me. No, you're different. Go to the box while I walk about. Lord Warburton went to the box, where Isabel's welcome was as to an honourable old friend. He exchanged greetings with Mr. Osmond, to whom he had been introduced the day before, and who, after he came in, sat blandly apart and silent. The others came back, and the bare, trivial opera began again. The box was large, and there was room for Lord Warburton to remain if he would sit a little behind. He did so for half an hour, but he heard nothing, and from his gloomy corner saw nothing but the clear profile of Isabel defined against the dim illumination of the house. At the next interval he departed. What's the character of that gentleman? Osmond asked of Isabel. Irreproachable, don't you see it? He owns about half England. That's his character, Henrietta remarked. Oh, happy man, said Gilbert Osmond. Do you call that happiness, the ownership of wretched human beings? cried Miss Stackpole. It seems to me you own a human being or two, Mr. Bantling suggested jocosely. I wonder if Warburton orders his tenants about as you do me. Poor Lord Warburton's a very nice man, Isabel said. But why do you speak of your friend as poor? inquired Osmond. Women, when they are very good, sometimes pity men after they've hurt them. That's their great way of showing kindness, said Ralph, joining in the conversation with a cynicism so transparently ingenious as to be virtually innocent. Pray, have I hurt Lord Warburton? Isabel asked, raising her eyebrows. It serves him right if you have, said Henrietta, as the curtain rose. Isabel saw no more of Lord Warburton for the next twenty-four hours, but then she encountered him in the capital, where he stood before some sculptures. She had come in with her companions, among whom on this occasion again Gilbert Osmond had his place. I'm leaving Rome, Lord Warburton told her. You'll probably think that strange after I told you how much I wanted to stay. Oh, no. You could easily change your mind. That's what I've done. Bon voyage, then. You're in a great hurry to get rid of me, said his lordship quite dismally. You obviously don't care what I do. Isabel looked at him a moment. Oh, you're not keeping your promise. He blushed. If I'm not, then it's because I can't, and that's why I'm going. Goodbye, then. Goodbye. He lingered still, however. When shall I see you again? Isabel hesitated. Some day, after you've married. That will never be. It will be after you are. That will do as well, she smiled. They shook hands, and he left her alone among the shining antique marbles. Shortly before the time fixed for Isabel's departure from Rome, she received a telegram from Mrs. Touchett. Leave Florence, June 4th for Bellagio, and take you if you have not other views, but can't wait if you dawdle in Rome. The dawdling in Rome was very pleasant, but Isabel let her aunt know she would immediately join her. She told Gilbert Osmond that she had done so, and he replied that he himself would stay a little longer. He would not return to Florence for ten days more, and in that case it might be months before he should see her again. This exchange took place in the sitting-room occupied by our friends at the hotel. It was late in the evening, and Osmond found the girl alone, reading. 
You'll say you'll come back, but who knows, he said to her. I think you may start on your voyage around the world. Well, I can take Italy in on the way, Isabel answered. On the way around the world? No, don't do that. Don't put us in a parenthesis. Give us a chapter to ourselves. I don't want to see you on your travels. I'd rather see you when they're over, when you're tired and satiated. Isabel, with her eyes bent, fingered the pages of her book. She was thinking that the pleasantest incident of her life, so it pleased her to qualify these days in Rome, was coming to an end. That most of the interest of the time had been owing to Mr. Osmond was a reflection she was not just now at pains to make. She might come back to Italy and find him different, this strange man who pleased her just as he was, and it would be better not to come than run the risk of that. But if she was not to come, the greater the pity that the chapter was closed. She felt a pang of regret that kept her silent. Gilbert Osmond was silent, too. Go everywhere, he said at last in a low, kind voice. Do everything, get everything out of life. Be happy. Doing all the vain things one likes is often very tiresome. Exactly, said Osmond with his quiet quickness. As I intimated just now, you'll be tired some day. He paused a moment and then went on. I don't know whether I had better not wait till then for something I want to say to you. Oh, I can't advise you without knowing what it is, but I'm horrid when I'm tired, Isabel added with due inconsequence. I'm speaking very seriously, Gilbert Osmond leaned forward. What I wish to say to you is that I find I'm in love with you. Isabel instantly rose. Oh, keep that till I am tired. Tired of hearing it from others? No, you may heed it now, or never, as you please. He got up and came near to her. I'm absolutely in love with you. I haven't the idea that it will matter much to you. I've too little to offer you. I've neither fortune nor fame nor extrinsic advantages of any kind. And if you were not going away, you'd know me better. I shall do that some other time, said Isabel, with a pale smile. I hope so. I'm very easy to know. No, no, she emphatically answered. You're not easy to know. No one could be less so. But you're very wise. So are you, Miss Archer. I don't feel so just now. Still, I'm wise enough to think you had better go. Good night. God bless you, said Gilbert Osmond, taking the hand which she failed to surrender. If we meet again, you'll find me as you leave me. If we don't, I shall be so all the same. But there's one thing more. I haven't asked anything of you, not even a thought in the future. But there's a little service I should like to ask. Go and see Pansy before you leave Florence. She's alone at the villa. Tell her she must love her poor father very much. It will be a great pleasure for me to go. On this, Gilbert Osmond took a rapid, respectful leave. Isabel stood a moment looking about her. Her agitation was very still, very deep. What had happened was something that for a week past her imagination had been going forward to meet. But here, when it came, she stopped. Her imagination hung back, unable to move. Isabel returned to Florence the following day with Ralph Touchett. She had three days before her departure, and she determined to spend the last of these visiting Pansy Osmond. Madame Merle was still at Casa Touchett, but she too was on the point of leaving Florence to stay in the mountains. Isabel mentioned to her that Mr. Osmond had asked her to visit Pansy, but she didn't mention his declaration of love. 
Well, I don't know about your going alone to the house of a handsome bachelor, Madame Merle exclaimed. But he's away. No one knows he's away. But perhaps it doesn't signify. I suppose you just want to be kind to the child. I wish very much to be kind to her. Go and see her, then. No one will be the wiser. As Isabel drove to Mr. Osmond's hilltop, she wondered what her friend had meant by this comment. Once in a while, this lady dropped a remark of ambiguous quality, struck a false note. But perhaps she had misunderstood. Pansy was strumming at the piano when Isabel was ushered into Mr. Osmond's drawing room. The little girl immediately came in and did the honours of her father's house with a wide-eyed earnestness of courtesy. Isabel wondered at her. She had never had so directly presented to her nose the white flower of cultivated sweetness. How well the child had been taught, thought our admiring young woman. How prettily she had been directed and fashioned, and yet how simple, how natural, how innocent she had been kept. Please tell me, Pansy said, did Papa in Rome go to see Madame Catherine? Perhaps he had no time. He wished to speak about my education. It isn't finished yet, you know. Papa told me one day he thought he would finish it himself. For the last year at the convent, the masters that teach the tall girls are so very dear. Papa's not rich, but I would like to return. I miss Madame Catherine very much. Papa has always been principally for holidays, but you must not tell him that. You shall not see him again. I'm very sorry. And he'll be sorry too, but it was very kind of you to come today. When Isabel left, she kissed the child goodbye and held her close. Be very good. Give pleasure to your father. I think that's what I live for, Pansy answered. He has not much pleasure. He's rather a sad man. Isabel listened to this assertion with an interest she felt obliged to conceal. She would have taken a passionate pleasure in talking of Gilbert Osmond to this innocent creature who was so near him, but she said no other word. Isabel stood at the window in the Palazzo Crescentini as though expecting a visitor. It was almost a year since she was there last. She felt herself a very different person from the frivolous young woman from Albany who had arrived at Garden Court a couple of years before. If her thoughts just now had inclined themselves to retrospect instead of worrying about the present, they would have evoked some interesting pictures. Over the past year, she had spent the summer with her sister Lily in Switzerland, and she had kept in contact with Madame Merle. After her sister's departure for America, she wrote to that lady that she would leave Switzerland immediately and make her way to Rome. She accomplished this journey without other assistance than that of her servant. Ralph Touchett was spending the winter at Corfu, and Miss Stackpole had been recalled to America by the interviewer. Isabel wrote to her aunt to apologize for not presenting herself just yet in Florence, 
but Mrs. Touchett was secretly pleased, because she took it for a sign that Gilbert Osmond was less in question there than formerly. Isabel, on her side, had not been a fortnight in Rome before she proposed to Madame Merle that they should travel east. Madame Merle remarked that she had always been consumed with a desire to visit Constantinople and Egypt, and the two ladies accordingly embarked on this expedition. Isabel returned to Rome at the end of March. A few days after her arrival, Gilbert Osmond descended from Florence and remained three weeks, during which the fact of her lodging with his old friend, Madame Merle, made it virtually inevitable that he should see her every day. When the last of April came, Isabel went to Florence, to Palazzo Crescentini. She found her aunt alone. Ralph, however, was expected daily, and Isabel was prepared to give him a most affectionate welcome. It was not of him, nevertheless, that she was thinking while she stood at the window and the servant showed in the visitor. She turned round when they were alone. Caspar Goodwood stood there, he had the air of a man who had travelled hard, and he offered no greeting. I can't tell you how I hoped you wouldn't come. I've no doubt of that. Caspar Goodwood looked about him for a seat. When did you arrive? Isabel asked, seating herself. Late last night. I left New York seventeen days ago. These Italian express trains go at the rate of an American funeral. That's in keeping. You must have felt as if you were coming to bury me. She forced a smile. I wish I could. I'd rather think of you dead than married to another man. That's very selfish of you, she returned. But to change the subject, she asked him if he had seen Henrietta Stackpole. Yes, she called at my office the day I got your letter. Did you tell her? Oh, no, said Caspar Goodwood simply. I didn't want to do that. Does she know Mr. Osmond? A little, and she doesn't like him. But of course I don't marry to please Henrietta. Caspar Goodwood ignored this, but asked her abruptly when her marriage would take place. I don't know. I can only say it will be soon. I've told no one but yourself and an old friend of Mr. Osmond's. Is it a marriage your friends won't like? I really haven't any idea. As I say, I don't marry for my friends. Who and what, then, is Mr. Gilbert Osmond? Who and what? Nobody and nothing but a very good and very honorable man, said Isabel. But what has he ever done? That I should marry him? Nothing at all. Give me up, Mr. Goodwood. I'm marrying a perfect non-entity. You don't mean that. You think he's grand, but no one else thinks so. Isabel's color deepened. Why do you always come back to what others think? I can't discuss Mr. Osmond with you. No. The young man looked gloomy. Well, I shan't trouble you for a long time. He stood up. One of the reasons why I came was that I wanted to hear what you would say in explanation of your having changed your mind. In explanation? Do you think I'm bound to explain? No, I suppose not. Well, at least I've seen you. He turned away, and no handshake, no sign of parting was exchanged between them. After he had gone out, Isabel burst into tears. An hour or so later, Isabel broke the news to her aunt. Aunt Lydia, I've something to tell you. Mrs. Touchett looked at her fiercely. You needn't tell me. I know what it is. You're going to marry that man. What man do you mean? Isabel inquired with great dignity. Madame Merle's friend, Mr. Osmond. I don't know why you call him Madame Merle's friend. If he's not her friend, he ought to be, after what she has done for him, cried Mrs. Touchett. If you mean that Madame Merle has had anything to do with my engagement, you're greatly mistaken, Isabel declared coldly. You mean that your attractions were sufficient without the gentleman's having had to be lashed up? You're quite right. They're immense, your attractions, and he would never presume to think of you if she hadn't taken the trouble to put him up to it. He has taken a great deal for himself, cried Isabel. 
Mrs. Touchett nodded. I think perhaps he must have to have made you like him so much. Was it for this that you refuse Lord Warburton? Please, don't go back to that. Why shouldn't I like Mr. Osmond? He has no money. He has no name. He has no importance. Do you marry him out of charity? It was my duty to tell you, Aunt Lydia, but I don't think it's my duty to explain to you. Even if it were, I shouldn't be able. Well, I'll say nothing more, but I don't know what Ralph will say. He cares very much for you. I know he does, and I shall feel the value of it now, for he knows that whatever I do, I do with reason. Ralph Touchett arrived the following day, and Isabel was shocked by his appearance. She had forgotten how ill he looked. But though Isabel was sure that Mrs. Touchett had lost no time in imparting to him the great fact, he showed at first no open knowledge of it. After three days had elapsed without him speaking of the matter, our young woman wearied of waiting. Dislike it as he would, he might at least go through the form. But since Ralph's arrival at Palazzo Crescentini, he had privately gone through many forms. His mother had literally greeted him with the great news, which had been even more sensibly chilling than Mrs. Touchett's maternal kiss. Ralph was shocked and humiliated. The person in the world in whom he was most interested was lost. What could he do? What could he say? At this moment, Gilbert Osmond showed himself little at Palazzo Crescentini, but Isabel met him every day elsewhere as she was now free to do. One morning, after meeting her lover, Isabel returned through the garden and saw Ralph sitting there in a chair. The extreme relaxation of his attitude suggested at first to Isabel that he was asleep. She stood for a moment looking at him. During this instant, he opened his eyes. I'm sorry I waked you. You looked so tired, she said, sitting down. I feel too tired, but I was not asleep. I was thinking of you. Are you tired of that? Very much so. It leads to nothing. What do you wish to arrive at? At the point of expressing to myself properly what I think of your engagement. Don't think too much of it, she lightly returned. But I had an idea you may have found me wanting in good manners. I've never congratulated you. Of course I've noticed that. Why were you silent? Ralph sat looking at her. I think I've hardly got over my surprise, he said at last. I had amused myself with planning out a high destiny for you. You were the last person I expected to see caught. I don't know why you call it caught. Because you're going to be put into a cage. If I like my cage, it needn't trouble you, she answered. But you're beating about the bush, Ralph. You wish to say you don't like Mr. Osmond, but you're afraid. I'm afraid of you, not of him. If you marry him... If I marry him? Have you had any expectation of dissuading me? Of course, that seems to you too fatuous. No, I know you've a great affection for me. I can't get rid of that. For heaven's sake, don't try. <coughs> Keep that well in sight. It will convince you how intensely I want you to do well. But you talk of my higher destiny. Surely there's nothing higher for a girl than to marry a person she likes. It's your liking the person we speak of that I venture to criticize, my dear cousin. He's the incarnation of taste, Ralph went on, thinking how he could best express Gilbert Osmond's sinister attributes. He judges and measures, approves and condemns altogether by that. It's a happy thing, then, that his taste should be exquisite. It's exquisite, indeed, since it has led him to select you. But have you ever seen this taste ruffled? I hope it may never be my fortune to fail to gratify my husband's. 
At these words, a sudden passion leapt to Ralph's lips. Oh, that's unworthy of you. You were meant for something better than to keep guard over the sensibilities of a sterile dilettante. Isabel rose quickly, and he did the same. You go too far, she breathed. I've said what I had on my mind, and I've said it because I love you. Isabel turned pale. Was he too on that tiresome list? Ah, oh, then you're not disinterested. I love you, but I love you without hope, said Ralph, forcing a smile and feeling that he had expressed too much. Isabel sighed. I'm afraid your talk, then, is the wilderness of despair. I don't understand it. I'm not arguing with you. It's impossible I should. It's very good of you to try to warn me, if you're really alarmed. But I shall forget what you've said as soon as possible. Try and forget it yourself. You've done your duty, and no man can do more. I can't explain to you what I feel, and I wouldn't if I could. Ralph stared at her. I told you last year that if you were to get into trouble, I should feel terribly sold. That's how I feel today. Do you think I'm in trouble? One's in trouble when one's in error. Very well, said Isabel. I shall never complain of my trouble to you. And she turned and walked away. Isabel, when she strolled in the cachine with her lover, felt no impulse to tell him how disliked he was by her aunt and cousin. This dislike was not alarming to Isabel. She scarcely even regretted it, for it served mainly to throw into higher relief the fact, in every way so honorable, that she married to please herself. One did other things to please other people. One did this for a more personal satisfaction. And Isabel's satisfaction was confirmed by her lover's admirable good conduct. Gilbert Osmond was in love, and he had never deserved less than during these still bright days, each of them numbered, the harsh criticism passed upon him by Ralph Touchett. Contentment on his part took no vulgar form. Excitement in the most self-conscious of men was a kind of ecstasy of self-control. He never forgot to be graceful and tender, to wear the appearance, which presented no difficulty, of stirred senses and deep intentions. He was immensely pleased with his young lady. Madame Merle had made him a present of incalculable value. He knew perfectly, though he had not been told, that their union enjoyed little favor with the girl's relations. And one morning he made an abrupt allusion to it. It's the difference in our fortune they don't like. They think I'm in love with your money. How do you know what they think? Isabel asked. Well, you've not told me they're pleased. If they had been delighted, I should have had some sign of it. And the fact of my being poor, and you rich, is the most obvious explanation of their reserve. But I don't mind them. 
I only care for one thing, for you're not having the shadow of a doubt. We've got my poor child to amuse us. It's all soft and mellow. It has the Italian coloring. They made a good many plans, but they left themselves also a great deal of latitude. It was a matter of course, however, that they should live for the present in Italy. It was in Italy that they had met. Italy had been a party to their first impressions of each other, and Italy should be a party to their happiness. One afternoon of the autumn of 1876, a young man of pleasing appearance rang at the door of an old Roman house. On its being opened, he inquired for Madame Merle, whereupon the servant ushered him into the drawing-room and requested his name. Mr. Edward Rosier, said the young man. Mr. Rosier was an ornament of Mrs. Touchett's American circle in Paris, but spent his summers in numerous resorts. In the summer of 1876, he passed a month in the Upper Engadine and encountered at St. Moritz a charming young girl. To this little person he began to pay particular attention. She struck him as exactly the household angel he had been looking for. He was nothing if not discreet, for he forbore for the present to declare his passion. But he decided to go in the autumn to Rome, where Miss Osmond was domiciled with her family. Mr. Rosier arrived in the Italian capital in November and attended Mrs. Osmond's soirees. It was while at the Palazzo Rocanera that he met Madame Merle, and thinking her well accepted within the family, he now came to her for advice. I care very much for Miss Osmond, he said, after exchanging greetings with Madame Merle. I should like particularly to know what you think of my prospects. I'm afraid Mr. Osmond doesn't consider me a collector's piece, although I think Mrs. Osmond would favor me. Very likely, if her husband doesn't. Rosier raised his eyebrows. Does she take the opposite line from him? In everything. They think quite differently, said Madame Merle. But have you declared your sentiments to the child? Never, cried Rosier. Never till I've assured myself of those of the parents. Well, you've excellent principles. You observe the proprieties, but what have you to offer? I've a comfortable little fortune, about 40,000 francs a year. With the talent I have for arranging, we can live beautifully on such an income. Beautifully, no. Sufficiently, yes. And Mr. Osmond, to the best of my belief, can give her nothing. Rosier scarcely demurred. I don't in the least desire that he should, but I may remark all the same that he lives like a rich man. The money is his wife's, and Mrs. Osmond will probably prefer to keep her money for her own children. Surely she has none. She may have yet. She had a poor little boy who died two years ago, six months after his birth. Others, therefore, may come. Madame Merle paused. But regarding your position, of course, 40,000 francs a year and a nice character are a combination to be considered. However, I'm not sure if Mr. Osmond will think so. But leave it to me. I'll try to make the most of your advantages. Edward Rosier presented himself the following Thursday at Mrs. Osmond's evening. He entered the warm, rich-looking reception rooms and looked around eagerly for the daughter of the house. Pansy was not in the first of the rooms, a large apartment with a concave ceiling and walls covered with old red damask. Osmond stood before the chimney, leaning back with his hands behind him. Half a dozen persons scattered near him were talking together. Rosier went up to shake hands with him. How do you do? My wife's somewhere about. Never fear, I shall find her, said Rosier cheerfully. Osmond, however, took him in. He had never in his life felt so efficiently looked at. Madame Merle has probably told him, and he doesn't like it, he privately reasoned. 
He took his course to the adjoining room and met Mrs. Osmond coming out of the doorway. She was dressed in black velvet, and she struck our young man as the picture of a gracious lady. You see, I'm very regular, he said. But who should be if I'm not? Yes, I've known you longer than anyone here. But can I introduce you to anyone? Thank you. But the simple truth is I'm dying to have a little talk with Miss Osmond. Oh, said Isabel, turning away. I can't help you there. But before Rosier had time to dwell on this comment, he saw his small sweetheart enter on the other side of the room. Pansy, now at nineteen, was a young lady who had grown very pretty, although she still had the innocent nature of a child. Rosier thought her perfect. She was everything he had always dreamed of. He was desperate to be alone with her. There was another room beyond the one in which they stood that had remained empty. It was upholstered in pale yellow, and through the open door it looked the very temple of authorized love. Rosier gazed a moment through this aperture. He had already been there with Osmond to inspect a huge clock of the First French Empire. Now, after supreme hesitation, he approached Pansy and asked her if he might go and look at the yellow room. Certainly you may go, said Pansy, and if you like, I'll show you. That's just what I hoped you'd say, murmured Rosier. They went in together. Rosier really thought the room very ugly. It's Papa's taste, explained Pansy. He has so much. He had a good deal, Rosier thought, but some of it was very bad. Doesn't Mrs. Osmond care how her rooms are done? Has she no taste? he asked. Oh, yes, a great deal, but it's more for literature, said Pansy, and for conversation. But Papa also cares for those things. I think he knows everything. Rosier was silent a little. There's one thing I'm sure he knows, he broke out presently. He knows that when I come here, it's really to see you. Pansy stood looking at him. Simply, intently, openly. I thought it was for that. And it was not disagreeable to you? I couldn't tell. I didn't know you never told me, said Pansy. Do you like me then, Pansy? Rosier asked very gently, feeling very happy. Yes, I like you. Rosier was elated. She liked him. She had liked him all the while. Now anything might happen. Madame Merle, meanwhile, had arrived at Palazzo Rocanera, and after embracing Mrs. Osmond, she sat down on a small sofa to commune with the master of the house. There was a brief exchange of commonplaces between these two, and then Madame Merle, whose eyes had been wandering, asked if little Mr. Rosier had come this evening. He came nearly an hour ago, but he has disappeared, Osmond said. Do you wish to see him? Madame Merle looked at him a moment. Yes, I should like to say to him that I've told you what he wants and that it interests you but feebly. Don't tell him that. Tell him I hate his proposal. He's a nuisance. Madame Merle dropped her eyes. She had a faint smile. He's a gentleman, he has a charming temper, and, after all, an income of 40,000 francs. It's misery, genteel misery, Osmond broke in. It's not what I've dreamed of for Pansy. But Pansy has thought a great deal about him. I don't consider that matters at all. Osmond gazed a while before him. This kind of thing doesn't find me unprepared. It's what I educated her for. It was all for this, that when such a case should come up, she should do what I prefer. At this point, Pansy came out of the adjoining room, followed by Edward Rosier. He has spoken to her, Madame Merle went on to Osmond. Her companion never turned his head. He ought to be horsewhipped. Madame Merle got up and moved towards Edward Rosier. 
He came to meet her, and very quickly, as if to get it off his mind. I've spoken to her, he whispered. I knew it, Mr. Rosier. Behave properly for the rest of the evening and come and see me tomorrow. She was severe, and in the manner in which she turned her back to him there was a degree of contempt. He had no intention of speaking to Osmond. It was neither the time nor the place. But he instinctively wandered toward Isabel. You said just now you wouldn't help me, he began to Mrs. Osmond. Perhaps you'll feel differently when you know, when you know... Isabel met his hesitation. When I know what? Well, that we've come to an understanding. It won't do. You're not rich enough for Pansy. She doesn't care a straw for one's money. No, but her father does, she said sharply. And never forget it. Seeing his solemn face, she was silent a minute. It's not that I won't help you, she continued passionately. I simply can't. Edward Rosier called to see Madame Merle the following day. She told him that Gilbert Osmond was not favorable to his suit and had requested the matter dropped for a few weeks. He doesn't like you having spoken to Pansy, Mr. Rosier. For the next month you must go to the house as little as possible and leave the rest to me. As little as possible? Go only on Thursday evenings with the rest of the world and don't fret about Pansy. I'll see that she understands everything. Edward Rosier fretted about Pansy a good deal, but he did as he was advised and waited another Thursday evening before returning to Palazzo Rocanera. An unexpected visitor also arrived that evening and made himself known to his host. Gilbert Osmond directed the gentleman over to his wife. Isabel, I bring you an old friend. Isabel was startled. She hardly knew if she felt pleasure or pain. I'm very happy to see Lord Warburton. Lord Warburton was heavier than of yore and looked older. He stood there very solidly and sensibly. I've but just arrived, but you see I've lost no time in coming to pay you my respects. I knew you were at home on Thursdays. Well, I'll leave you and Mrs. Osmond together, Lord Warburton. You have reminiscences into which I don't enter. I'm afraid you lose a great deal, sir, Lord Warburton called after Osmond as he moved away, in a tone which perhaps betrayed overmuch an appreciation of his generosity. Then the visitor turned on Isabel the deepest consciousness of his look, which gradually became more serious. I'm really very glad to see you. You're very kind. They sat down, and Isabel asked him about his sisters, with other inquiries of a somewhat perfunctory kind. He answered her questions as if they interested him, and in a few moments she saw, or believed she saw, 
that he would press with less of his whole weight than of yore. There's something I must tell you without more delay, Mrs. Osmond. I've brought Ralph Touchett with me. Brought him with you? He's at the hotel, but he was too tired to come out. But why has he come to Rome? I heard from him that he had determined to give up wintering abroad and remain in England, indoors, in what he called an artificial climate. Poor fellow. He doesn't succeed with artificial. I went to see him three weeks ago at Garden Court and found him thoroughly ill. He's been getting worse every year. Mrs. Touchett is in America, and he felt it would be the saving of him to spend the winter at Catania. I wanted him to go by sea to save fatigue, but he said he hated the sea and wished to stop at Rome. After that, I made up my mind to come with him. He has been very bad since we left England a fortnight ago. He's got a rather good man, but I'm afraid he's beyond human help. I sometimes think he is dying. Isabel sprang up. I'll go to him then now. Lord Warburton checked her. I don't mean I thought so tonight. On the contrary, today he seemed particularly well. The idea of our reaching Rome gave him strength. An hour ago he told me he was very tired but very happy. Go to him in the morning. Isabel had many questions to ask about Ralph, but she abstained from asking them all. She would see for herself on the morrow. Edward Rosier had, meanwhile, seated himself near Pansy. She asked him who was the new gentleman conversing with her stepmother. He's an English lord. I don't know his name. But never mind him. I've something particular to say to you. Don't speak so loud, said Pansy. Papa has been terribly severe. What has he done to you? He asked me what you had done to me, and I told him everything. Then he forbade me to marry you. You needn't mind that. But I can't disobey Papa. Oh, you disappoint me, groaned poor Rosier. I'll speak to Mrs. Osmond. Oh, she won't help us much. I think she's afraid of your father. Pansy shook her little head. She's not afraid of anyone. We must have patience. Oh, that's an awful word. Rosier was deeply disconcerted. Oblivious of the customs of good society, he dropped his head into his hands and sat staring at the carpet. Presently he became aware of a good deal of movement about him, and as he looked up, saw Pansy making a curtsy to the English lord whom Mrs. Osmond had introduced. Ralph Touchett had seen very little of Isabel since her marriage. No reference was ever again made between them to Ralph's opinion of Gilbert Osmond, and by surrounding this topic with a sacred silence, they managed to preserve a semblance of reciprocal frankness. But there was a difference, as Ralph often said to himself. As Osmond's wife, Isabel could never again be his friend. He consoled himself as he might by behaving beautifully, and was present at the ceremony by which Isabel was united to Mr. Osmond in Florence. The thing was done at the little American chapel on a hot June day, in the presence only of Mrs. Touchett and her son, of Pansy Osmond and the Countess Gemini. Madame Merle had been invited, but she wrote that she was unable to leave Rome. Ralph knew little of Isabel's life in the two years that followed. Once, while he was spending the winter in San Remo, Ralph visited her. She had lost her child. That was a sorrow, but it was a sorrow she scarcely spoke of. There was more to say about it than she could say to Ralph. She appeared to be leading the life of the world. Ralph heard her spoken of as having a charming position. People considered it a privilege to know her. The free, keen girl had become quite another person. What he saw was the fine lady who was supposed to represent something. What did Isabel represent, Ralph asked himself, and he could only answer by saying that she represented Gilbert Osmond. He recognized Osmond at every turn, he saw how he kept all things within limits, how he adjusted, regulated, 
animated their manner of life. Everything he did was affectation, affectation so subtly considered that one often mistook it for impulse. His tastes, his studies, his accomplishments, his collections were all for a purpose. For Gilbert Osmond, Ralph was not important. He was Isabel's cousin and he was rather unpleasantly ill. Osmond made the proper inquiries, asked about his health, about Mrs. Touchett. He addressed him on the few occasions of their meeting, not a word that was not necessary. For all this, Ralph had had, toward the end of his visit, a sharp inward vision of Osmond's making it difficult for his wife to continue to receive him. He was not jealous. No one could be jealous of Ralph. But he made Isabel pay for her old-time kindness, and as Ralph had no idea of her paying too much, he had taken himself off. In doing so, he had deprived Isabel of a very interesting occupation. She had been constantly wondering what fine principle was keeping him alive. But what kept Ralph Touchett alive was simply the fact that he had not yet seen enough of the person in the world in whom he was most interested. He wanted to see what she would make of her husband, or what her husband would make of her. This was only the first act of the drama, and he was determined to sit out the performance. His determination had held good. It had kept him going some eighteen months more, till the time of his return to Rome with Lord Warburton. Isabel called to see Ralph the day after Lord Warburton had notified her of his arrival in Rome. She spent an hour with him. It was the first of several visits. A fortnight elapsed, at the end of which Ralph announced to Lord Warburton that he wouldn't be going to Sicily. Do you mean your return to England? Oh, dear, no. I'll stay in Rome. Rome won't do for you. Rome's not warm enough. I'll make it do. See how well I've done? Lord Warburton looked at him a while, trying to see it. I say, he suddenly broke out, did you really mean to go to Sicily when we started? Oh, you ask too many questions. Let me put one. Did you come with me quite disinterestedly? I don't know what you mean by that. I wanted to come abroad. I suspect we've each been playing our little game. Well, what does Mrs. Osmond think? Ralph's companion asked eventually. I've not told her. She'll probably say that Rome's too cold and even offer to go with me to Catania. In your place, I should like that. Her husband won't like it, and I don't want to make any more trouble between them. Is there so much already? There's complete preparation for it. Osmond isn't fond of me. Then won't he make a row if you stop here? That's what I want to see. You're sacrificing your health to your curiosity, then. I'm not much interested in my health, and I'm deeply interested in Mrs. Osmond. So am I. But I don't mean to make love to her again, Lord Warburton added quickly. I'm delighted to hear it, but permit me to ask, Ralph went on, whether it's to bring out this fact that you're so very civil to the little girl. Lord Warburton gave a slight start. Well, I think her a delightful little person. Of course, there's the difference in our ages. My dear Warburton, said Ralph, are you really serious? Perfectly serious, as far as I've got. I'm very glad. And heaven help us, cried Ralph. How cheered up old Osmond will be. His companion frowned. He's not so fond of me as that. As that? My dear Warburton, the drawback of your position is that people needn't be fond of you at all to wish to be connected with you. But Lord Warburton scarcely seemed to be listening. Do you judge she'll be pleased? The girl? <laughs> Delighted, surely. No, no, I mean Mrs. Osmond. She's very fond of Pansy. Very true. 
Very true. And Ralph slowly got up. I hope, you know, that you're very, very sure. The juice, he broke off. I don't know how to say it. Yes, you do. You know how to say everything. Well, it's awkward. I hope you're sure that among Miss Osmond's merits, her being so near her stepmother isn't a leading one. Good heavens, touch it, cried Lord Warburton angrily. What do you take me for? Isabel did not see too much of Madame Merle during the first two years of her marriage. This lady had made numerous visits to distant friends and gave countenance to the idea that for the future she should be a less inveterate Roman than in the past. It was not until the winter, during which we have renewed acquaintance with our heroine, that the personage in question made again a continuous stay in Rome. But by this time, Isabel's needs and inclinations had considerably changed. It was not at present to Madame Merle that she would have applied for instruction. She had lost the desire to know this lady's clever trick. If she had troubles, she must keep them to herself. One day, about a month after Ralph Touchett's arrival in Rome, Isabel came back from a walk with Pansy. Pansy was very dear to her. The two were constantly together. On this particular day, Pansy had picked some wild flowers, and on returning to Palazzo Rocanera, she went straight to her room to put them into water. Isabel passed into the drawing room, the one she herself usually occupied. But just beyond the threshold, she stopped short. Madame Merle was there in her bonnet, and Gilbert Osmond was talking to her. For a minute they were unaware she had come in. Madame Merle was standing a little way from the fire. Osmond was in a deep chair, leaning back and looking at her. What struck Isabel first was that he was sitting while Madame Merle stood. Then she perceived that they were musing face to face, with the freedom of old friends who sometimes exchange ideas without uttering them. There was nothing to shock in this. They were old friends. But the thing made an image, lasting only a moment, like a sudden flicker of light. Madame Merle had seen her and had welcomed her without moving. Her husband, on the other hand, had instantly jumped up and, after murmuring something, left the room. I've come to see you, said Madame Merle, to get rid of a trouble of my own, to make it over to you. I've been talking to your husband about it. I'm surprised at that. He doesn't like troubles. Especially other people's, I know very well. But it's about poor Mr. Rosier. He comes to see me every day to talk about Pansy. Yes, he wants to marry her. I know all about it. Madame Merle hesitated. I gathered from your husband that perhaps you didn't. How should he know what I know? However, I can do nothing. I have told him to be patient, but now he has taken it into his head to be jealous. 
jealous. Jealous of Lord Warburton. He thinks there's nothing impossible in Lord Warburton's falling in love with Pansy. Isabel was silent a little. It's true. There's nothing impossible. So I've had to admit to Mr. Rosier, so too your husband thinks. That I don't know. But I see no reason why I shouldn't tell you that Lord Warburton likes my stepdaughter very much. And you've never told Osmond? This observation was immediate, precipitate. It almost burst from Madame Merle's lips. Isabel's eyes rested on her. I suppose he'll know in time. Lord Warburton has a tongue. That would be a great marriage. Much better than marrying poor Mr. Rosier, sighed Madame Merle. Much better, I think. But you had better wait till he asks her. If what you say is true, he'll ask her. Especially, Madame Merle said in a moment, if you make him. If I make him? You've great influence with him. Isabel frowned. Where did you learn that? Mrs. Touchett told me. Not you, never, said Madame Merle, smiling. She told me you had declined his offer of marriage. Of course, I think you've done better in doing as you did. But if you wouldn't marry Lord Warburton yourself, make him the reparation of helping him to marry someone else. Isabel was silent for a while. But in a moment she said reasonably and gently enough, I should be very glad indeed if, as regards Pansy, it could be arranged. Upon which her companion embraced her, more tenderly than might have been expected, and triumphantly withdrew. Osmond touched on this matter that evening for the first time, coming very late into the drawing-room where Isabel was sitting alone. They had spent the evening at home, and Pansy had gone to bed. He himself had been sitting since dinner in his study. At ten o'clock, Lord Warburton had come in. He was going somewhere else and had sat for half an hour. Isabel, after asking him for news of Ralph, said very little to him, on purpose. She wished him to talk with her stepdaughter. It would please her husband greatly to see Pansy married to an English nobleman. It seemed to Isabel that if she could make it her duty to bring about such an event, she should play the part of a good wife, and she wanted to believe sincerely that she had been that. Enthusiasm had not come at first to Isabel, but it came today, and it made her feel almost happy. She was on the point of going out of the room and leaving Pansy and Lord Warburton alone, but something held her back. There was a vague doubt that interposed, a sense that she was not quite sure. So she remained in the drawing-room, and after a while Lord Warburton went off to his party. Pansy said nothing whatever about him after he had gone, and went to bed. Isabel remained alone, looking at the fire, until her husband came in. He sat down in silence. Has Lord Warburton been here? he presently asked. Yes, he stayed half an hour and sat on the sofa with Pansy. It seems to me he's attentive. Isn't that what you call it? If you wish, said Isabel. Osmond turned to her. Are you trying to quarrel with me? No, I'm trying to live at peace. Nothing's more easy. You know I don't quarrel myself. What do you call it when you try to make me angry? I don't try. Isabel smiled. It doesn't matter. I've determined never to be angry again. Good. That's partly why I've not spoken to you about this business of my daughter's, Osmond said. I was afraid I should encounter opposition. I've sent your old friend Rosier about his business. Mr. Rosier is an old friend. But as regards Pansy, I've given him no encouragement. That's fortunate, Osmond observed. My daughter has only to sit perfectly quiet 
to make a great marriage and become Lady Warburton. But perhaps she won't sit perfectly quiet if she loses Mr. Rosier, said Isabel frankly. Osmond sat gazing at the fire. She wishes above all to please me. But meantime, I should like our distinguished visitor to speak. He has spoken to me. He has told me he is absolutely charmed by Pansy. Osmond turned his head quickly. Why didn't you tell me that? He asked sharply. You must have a great deal of influence with him. He got up and stood before the fire. Well, Pansy's future lies in your hands. With a little goodwill, you may do as I desire. Think it over, he said, and strolled out of the room. Isabel leaned back in her chair and closed her eyes. The suggestion from another that she had a definite influence on Lord Warburton. This had given her the start that accompanies unexpected recognition. Was it true that there was something still between them that might be a handle to make him declare himself to Pansy? Was he in love with Gilbert Osmond's wife? Was she to cultivate the advantage she possessed in order to make him commit himself to Pansy, knowing he would do so for her sake and not for the small creature's own? Was this the service her husband had asked of her? Isabel's soul was haunted with terrors which crowded to the foreground of thought. The strange impression she had received that afternoon of her husband's being in more direct communication with Madame Merle than she suspected kept coming back to her. And now she wondered it had never come before. Isabel had a deep distrust of her husband. She flattered herself that she had kept her failing faith to herself, however, that no one suspected it but Osmond. Oh, he knew it, and there were times when she thought he enjoyed it. It had come gradually. It was not till the first year of their life together, so admirably intimate at first, had closed, that she had taken the alarm. Then the shadows had begun to gather, it was as if Osmond deliberately, almost malignantly, had put the lights out, one by one. He was not violent. He was not cruel. She simply believed he hated her. He had discovered that she was so different, that she was not what he had believed she would prove to be. She had too many ideas. He had thought at first he could change her, and she had done her best to be what he would like. But she was, after all, herself. And now there was no use pretending, wearing a mask, for he knew her and had made up his mind. She was not afraid of him. She had no apprehension he would hurt her, for the ill will he bore her was not of that sort. Until that morning he had scarcely spoken to her for a week, she knew there was a special reason. He was displeased at Ralph Touchett's staying on in Rome. He had told her a week before that it was indecent she should visit him at his hotel. It was Isabel's honest belief that she was not defiant. But she certainly couldn't pretend to be indifferent to Ralph. She believed he was dying, and that she should never see him again, and this gave her a tenderness for him she had never known before. Ralph made her feel the good of the world. He made her feel what might have been. And thus it seemed to her an act of devotion to conceal her misery from him. It lived before her again, that morning in the garden at Florence when he had warned her against Osmond. She had only to close her eyes to see the place, to hear his voice. She had told him then that from her at least he should never know if he was right. And this was what she was taking care of now. It gave her plenty to do. There was passion, exultation, religion in it. Isabel sat and watched the fire go out. Her mind, assailed by visions, was in a state of extraordinary activity. 
But the main vision that she kept returning to was that of her husband and Madame Merle, unconsciously and familiarly associated. Later that week, Isabel took Pansy to a great party. Pansy was never in want of partners, and very soon after their arrival, she gave Isabel, who was not dancing, her bouquet to hold. Isabel had rendered her this service for some minutes when she became aware of the presence of Edward Rosier. He looked at her somewhat fiercely and then dropped his eyes on the bouquet. It's all Pansy's. It must be hers, he said softly. May I have one flower, Mrs. Osmond? Isabel hesitated a moment and then held out the bouquet. Choose one, but don't put it in your buttonhole. I should like Pansy to see it. She has refused to dance with me, but I believe in her still. Her father has told her not to talk to you and she'll never disobey him. But she's coming back to me, Isabel added, and you must go away. Rosier lingered a moment till Pansy came near, and then he walked away. Pansy took the bouquet, and Isabel saw she was counting the flowers. But she said nothing before being taken onto the dance floor again. She had not been absent many minutes when Isabel saw Lord Warburton approaching. He bade her good evening. Where's the little maid? She's dancing. He looked among the dancers and then said, won't you dance with me? Thank you. I'd rather you should dance with the little maid. Of course I will, if you like. If I like? Oh, if you dance with her only because I like it. Isabel stood staring at him. Lord Warburton, you told me ten days ago you'd like to marry my stepdaughter. You've not forgotten it. Forgotten it? I wrote to Mr. Osmond about it this morning. Ah said Isabel. He didn't mention it to me. Well, I didn't send my letter, but I shall send it tomorrow. You still wish to marry her? Very much indeed. Isabel said no more, and Lord Warburton looked about him. He had noticed a melancholy youth staring at them, and he asked Isabel who he was. It's the young man who's in love with Pansy. He looks rather bad. He has reason. My husband won't listen to him. He hasn't money enough. Dear me, he looked a well-set-up young fellow. How much money has he got? Some 40,000 francs a year. 1,600 pounds. Ah, oh, but that's very good, you know. So I think, replied Isabel. But you seem very interested in your rival. My rival? Do you call him my rival? Surely. If you both wish to marry the same person. Yes, but since he has no chance. Pansy would like to think he had. A quick blush sprang to Lord Warburton's brow. You told me she would have no wish apart from her father's, and as I've gathered that he would favour me. Yes, I told you she has an immense wish to please her father. That seems to me a very proper feeling. 
said Lord Warburton. Certainly. Isabel paused. But it hardly strikes me as the sort of feeling to which a man would wish to be indebted for a wife. Lord Warburton looked quickly at his friend. Why are you so unwilling, so sceptical? She met his eyes, and for a moment they looked straight at each other. She saw in his expression the gleam of an idea that she was uneasy on her own account. It told her what she wanted to know. The Countess Gemini was often extremely bored. She lived with her eyes upon Rome, and it was the constant grievance of her life that she had not an habitation there. She heard a great deal about Isabel and knew she was having a beautiful time. She had indeed seen it for herself when she had spent a week at Palazzo Rocanera during the first winter of her brother's marriage, but she had not been encouraged to renew this satisfaction, at least up till now. She had recently had an invitation from Osmond himself. Several days before the Countess was due to start for Rome, Henrietta Stackpole called upon her. They had met briefly at Mrs. Touchett's. I seem to remember that when I saw you before, you were very interesting. I made use of some of your comments afterwards in an article. Dear me, cried the Countess, staring and half alarmed. I had no idea I ever said anything remarkable. I didn't mention your name. I only said a lady of high rank. Oh, I wouldn't have minded, said the Countess. I'm not at all like my brother. Now, if you were to quote him in your paper, he'd never forgive you. He needn't be afraid. I shall never refer to him, said Miss Stackpole with bland dryness. That's another reason why I wanted to come to see you. Mr. Osmond has never liked me, but now he has tried to break up my relations with Isabel, so I'm going to Rome. So am I, the Countess cried. We'll go together. Are you staying with Isabel? No, I wrote to her I was coming, and she answered that she would engage a room for me at a pensione. She gave no reason. The reason's Osmond. Isabel ought to make a stand, said Miss Stackpole. I'm afraid she has changed a great deal. Have you any idea what is happening? I see and hear very little of Osmond, the Countess shrugged. Do you know Lord Warburton? I know him very well. I don't know him, but I'm told he's making love to Isabel. <gasps> making love to her? So I'm told. I don't know the details, said the Countess lightly. Henrietta gazed earnestly at her companion. Do you mean that Isabel's guilty? Oh, dear, no, not yet, I hope. I only mean that Osmond's very tiresome, and the Lord Warburton, as I hear, is a great deal at the house. I'm afraid you're scandalized. No, I'm just anxious, Henrietta said. I shall leave for Rome tomorrow. Dear me, I'm sorry, I can't leave for a week. I'm having some dresses made. I'm told Isabel receives immensely. But I shall see you there. I shall call on you at your pensione. On leaving the Countess, Henrietta made her way to the center of Florence. Armed with a map, she located a small tourist hotel and asked the porter if Mr. Goodwood was at home. I'm very pleased to see you. Caspar Goodwood said as he met her. It was not to please you I came, replied Henrietta. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to consider whether it's a good thing on the whole for you to go to Rome. I thought you were going to say that, he answered rather artlessly. You have considered it then? Of course I have, very carefully. Otherwise I shouldn't have come so far as this. I was thinking it over when I saw you in Paris two months ago. I'm afraid you decided it was best for you first and Mrs. Osmond next. Oh, it won't do her any good. I just want to see her myself. Won't it do her some harm? That's the question. Caspar Goodwood stared at her. Have you heard something about her? Yes, I've heard. But as I don't want you to go to Rome, I won't tell you. 
Just as you please. I shall see for myself. You've heard she's unhappy. Oh, you won't see that, Henrietta exclaimed. Isabel went to visit Ralph at his hotel the day after the dance. Osmond had not yet formally forbidden her to call upon her cousin, but she felt sure that unless Ralph should very soon depart, this prohibition would come. How could poor Ralph depart? The weather as yet made it impossible. She came very soon to what she wished to speak of. I want you to answer me a question, Ralph. It's about Lord Warburton. I think I can guess your question, Ralph answered from his armchair. Please, then, answer it. Oh, I don't say I can do that. You're intimate with him, she said. Is he really in love? Very much, I think. Ah, oh, said Isabel dryly. It's, after all, no business of mine. You're very philosophic. Ralph stared at her. May I inquire what you're talking about? I thought you knew. Lord Warburton tells me he wants to marry Pansy. Is it your belief that he really cares for her? Ah, oh, for Pansy, no, cried Ralph very positively. But you said just now he did. Ralph waited a moment. That he cared for you, Mrs. Osmond. Oh, Ralph, you give me no help, she cried abruptly and passionately. It was the first time she had alluded to the need for help, and the words shook her cousin with their violence. It seemed to him that at last the gulf between them had been bridged. How unhappy you must be, he murmured tenderly. He had no sooner spoken than she recovered her self-possession. When I talk of your helping me, I talk great nonsense, she said with a quick smile. The matter's very simple. Lord Warburton must get on by himself. He'll do nothing dishonorable, said Ralph. I'm very sure of that. Nothing can be more honorable than for him to leave the poor child alone. She cares for another person. But your husband surely won't like that. Isabel hesitated, frowning a little. Are you pleading Lord Warburton's cause? Not in the least. I'm very glad he shouldn't become your stepdaughter's husband. It makes a very queer relation to you, said Ralph, smiling. But I'm rather nervous, lest your husband should think you haven't pushed him enough. He knows me well enough not to have expected me to push. Her mask had dropped for an instant, but she had pulled it on again. Ralph had an almost savage desire to hear her complain of her husband, hear her say that she should be held accountable for Lord Warburton's defection. You will be decidedly at variance all the same he said in a moment. He saw she was nervous, afraid of what he might say. It's a matter we can hardly quarrel about, for almost all the interest is on his side. Pansy's, after all, his daughter. Isabel put out her hand to wish him goodbye. Ralph took an inward resolution that she shouldn't leave him without his letting her know that he knew everything. Do you know what his interest will make him say? He asked as he took her hand. She shook her head. It will make him say that your want of zeal is owing to jealousy. He stopped a moment. Her face made him afraid. To jealousy? To jealousy of his daughter. She blushed red. You are not kind she said in a voice he had never heard. Be frank with me and you'll see. But she made no reply. She only pulled her hand out of his own and rapidly withdrew from the room.
Isabel made up her mind to speak to Pansy, and she went to the girls' room before dinner that day. Pansy was sitting by the fire, and Isabel sat beside her. What Isabel wished to do was to hear from Pansy's own lips that her mind was not occupied with Lord Warburton. But if she desired the assurance, she felt herself by no means at liberty to provoke it. The girl's father would have qualified this as rank treachery. When Isabel broached the subject, Pansy begged her for advice. It's difficult for me to advise you, Isabel returned. That's for your father. I think I should like your advice better than Papa's, Pansy said quietly. A lady can advise a young girl better than a man. Well, perhaps I can try to learn what you desire and act accordingly. Pansy presently told her that the only thing she wanted in life was to marry Mr. Rosier. He had asked her, and she had told him she would do so if her papa would allow it. Now her papa wouldn't allow it. Then it's impossible, Isabel announced. You must think of something else. What should you like me to do? Pansy softly demanded. The question was a terrible one, and Isabel took refuge in timorous vagueness. To remember all the pleasure it's in your power to give to your father. To marry someone else, you mean? Yes. The child stared at her. Isabel believed she was doubting her sincerity. Then she stood up and quavered, Well, I hope no one will ask me. Isabel also got up and stood a moment looking into the fire. Lord Warburton has shown you a great attention. He's very kind, and I like him very much, but if you mean that he'll propose for me, I think you're mistaken. Perhaps I am, but your father would like it extremely. Pansy shook her head. Lord Warburton won't propose simply to please Papa. He knows I don't want to marry, and he therefore won't trouble me, and he doesn't care for me either. Perhaps you should tell your father that, remarked Isabel reservedly. You oughtn't to let him have false hopes. Maybe not. But so long as he believes that Lord Warburton intends anything of the kind, Papa won't propose anyone else. And that will be an advantage for me, said the child very lucidly. Isabel drew a long breath. She felt relieved of a heavy responsibility. Lord Warburton was not seen in Mrs. Osmond's drawing room for several days, and Osmond was in a state of expectancy. At the end of four days, he alluded to his absence. What has become of Warburton? I saw him last Friday at the German ball, Isabel said. He told me then that he meant to write to you. He has never written to me. Be so good as to remind him. You expect too much of me. Ah, yes. I expect a great deal of you. I'm afraid I shall disappoint you. My expectations have survived a good deal of disappointment. Of course I know that. Think how I must have disappointed myself. If you really wish hands laid on Lord Warburton, you must lay them yourself. That won't be easy, with you working against me. Isabel started. I think you accuse me of something very base, she returned. I accuse you of not being trustworthy. If he doesn't come forward, it will be because you've kept him off. At this moment, a servant came in, followed the next by Lord Warburton. He looked rapidly from the master of the house to the mistress. Osmond was embarrassed. He found nothing to say. But Isabel remarked, promptly enough, that they had been in the act of talking about their visitor. Upon this, her husband added that they had been afraid he had gone away. No, no. Lord Warburton explained, smiling. I'm only on the point of going. And then he mentioned that he found himself suddenly recalled to England. For a moment, neither of his companions spoke. Osmond only leaned back in his chair, listening. Isabel didn't look at him. She could only fancy how he looked. Lord Warburton sat there a quarter of an hour, talking as if he might not soon see them again, unless, indeed, they should come to England, a course he strongly recommended. Why shouldn't they come to England in the autumn, 
It would give him much pleasure to have them come and spend a month with him. It would amuse Miss Osmond as well. He asked if she were not at home. Couldn't he say goodbye? Osmond rose at this point. If you'll excuse me, I'll see if my daughter's disengaged. Of course, when you come to Rome, you'll always look us up. Mrs. Osmond will decide about the English expedition. The nod with which, instead of a handshake, he wound up the conversation was perhaps a rather meager form of salutation, but on the whole it was all the occasion demanded. I hope he'll make Miss Osmond come, Lord Warburton remarked. I want very much to see her. I'm glad it's the last time, said Isabel. So am I. She doesn't care for me. No, she doesn't care for you. They talked a little of Ralph, and in another moment Pansy came in. I'm going away, Lord Warburton said. I want to bid you goodbye. Goodbye, Lord Warburton. And I want to tell you how much I wish you may be very happy. Thank you, Lord Warburton. He lingered a moment and gave a glance at Isabel. You ought to be very happy. You've got a guardian angel. Then he shook hands with Isabel in silence, and presently he was gone. I think you are my guardian angel, Pansy exclaimed very sweetly. That evening after dinner, Gilbert Osmond went into his wife's sitting room. He stood by the fire a while and then said, I don't understand what you wish to do. I haven't the least idea what you mean. You played a very deep game. You managed it beautifully. What is it you are accusing me of? Of having prevented Pansy's marriage to Warburton. On the contrary, I took a great interest in it. You pretended to, and then you used your ingenuity to get him out of the way. Where's the letter you told me he had written me? I haven't the least idea. I haven't asked him. You stopped it on the way, said Osmond. Isabel stared at him. Oh, Gilbert, for a man who was so fine, she exclaimed in a long murmur, and she left the room. It was from Henrietta Stackpole that Isabel learned how Caspar Goodwood had come to Rome, an event that took place three days after Lord Warburton's departure. This latter fact had been preceded by an incident of some importance to Isabel, the temporary absence, once again, of Madame Merle, who had gone to Naples. Madame Merle had ceased to minister to Isabel's happiness, who found herself wondering whether the most discreet of women might not also by chance be the most dangerous. It seemed to her that she had not done with her. This lady had something in reserve. Isabel was pleased to have her friend's company. Henrietta had crossed the stormy ocean in midwinter because she guessed that Isabel was sad. Henrietta guessed a great deal, but she had never guessed so happily as this. Isabel's satisfactions now were few, and it was a relief to confess to this confidant, the first person to whom she had owned it, that she was not in the least at her ease. Henrietta had herself approached this point without delay and had accused her to her face of being wretched. Yes, I'm wretched, Isabel said mildly. What does he do to you? He does nothing. He doesn't like me. Why don't you leave him? cried Miss Stackpole. I can't change that way. I married him before all the world. I can't publish my mistake. Henrietta gave a laugh. Don't you think you're rather too considerate? It's not of him that I'm considerate. It's of myself. It was not surprising Gilbert Osmond should dislike Miss Stackpole, his instinct had naturally set him in opposition to a young lady capable of advising his wife to withdraw from the conjugal roof. Isabel said to Henrietta that she couldn't invite her to dine, but they could easily see each other in other ways. Isabel received Miss Stackpole freely in her own sitting room and took her repeatedly to drive. 
Caspar Goodwood eventually wrote that he would call at Palazzo Rocanera. Isabel wondered what he was coming for, what good he expected to get of it. He had presented himself hitherto as a person destitute of compromise, who would take what he had asked for or take nothing. Isabel's hospitality, however, raised no questions, and she found no great difficulty in appearing happy enough to deceive him. It was her conviction, at least, that she had deceived him, made him say to himself that she was happy. She never found out what he had come to Rome for. He offered her no explanation. There could be none but the very simple one that he wanted to see her. In other words, he had come for his amusement, and this was exactly what she wanted, for if he cared for amusement, he had got over his heartache. She had been obliged to introduce him to Gilbert. It was impossible that she should not ask him to dinner to her Thursday evenings, of which she had grown very weary, but which her husband still insisted on holding. To the Thursdays, Mr. Goodwood came regularly, solemnly, he appeared to regard them with a good deal of gravity. He got on much better with Osmond than had seemed probable, and Isabel could see that Mr. Goodwood thought better of her husband than he had ever wished to. One evening, Isabel bethought herself of saying to him that if he were willing, he could render her a service. And then she added, smiling, I don't know, however, what right I have to ask a service of you. You're the person in the world who has most right, he answered. The service was that he should go and see her cousin Ralph, who was ill at the Hotel de Paris alone, and be as kind to him as possible. Mr. Goodwood had never seen him, but if she was not mistaken, Ralph had once invited him to Garden Court. Caspar remembered the invitation perfectly, and felt sorry for the poor gentleman who lay dying at a Roman inn. He called at the Hôtel de Paris, and on being shown into the presence of the master of Garden Court, found Miss Stackpole sitting beside his sofa. She had not been asked by Isabel to go and see Ralph, but on hearing that he was too ill to come out, had immediately gone of her own motion. After this she had paid him a daily visit, and they had become excellent friends. They talked about everything, and always differed, about everything, that is, but Isabel, a topic as to which Ralph always had a thin forefinger to his lips. Towards the end of February, Ralph Touchett made up his mind to return to England. He mentioned his intention to Henrietta. I suppose you know you can't go alone. I shall have a servant with me, Ralph answered. But you'll need a woman's care. I've had so much of yours for the past fortnight that it will last me a good while. You've not had enough of it yet. I'm coming with you. It won't be easy, but you had better go all the same. That same day, Caspar Goodwood visited Ralph, 
who informed his visitor that Miss Stackpole was to conduct him back to England. Ah, oh, said Casper, Mrs. Osmond had made me promise to go with you. Good heavens, it's the golden age. <coughs> You're all too kind, but there's really no need of your coming. Henrietta's extraordinarily efficient. I'm sure of that, but I've promised Mrs. Osmond, and she wants me to leave Rome. She thinks I'm watching her. Watching her? To see if she's happy. She's the most visibly happy woman I know, said Ralph. Exactly, Goodwood answered dryly. She pretends to be happy. I thought I should like to see for myself what it amounts to. I've seen, and I don't want to see any more. Do you know I think it's time you should leave? Ralph rejoined. And this was the only conversation these gentlemen had about Isabel Osmond. It was decided that the small party should leave the next day, and Ralph immediately pulled himself together for the departure. Isabel went to see him. I wish I could have seen more of you during your stay here, she said, but when one's married one has so much occupation. Fortunately, I'm not married. <coughs> when you come to see me in England, I shall be able to entertain you with all the freedom of a bachelor. Ralph talked as if they should certainly meet again, and made no allusion to his term being near, to the probability that he should not outlast the summer. If he preferred it so, Isabel was willing enough. She spoke of his journey, of the stages into which he should divide it, and the precautions he should take. With Henrietta at the head of your little band, she laughed, there will be nothing left for Mr. Goodwood. Oh, my dear Isabel, there is nothing left for Mr. Goodwood. She colored, and then observed quickly that she must leave him. They stood together a moment, holding hands. You've been my best friend, she said. It was for you that I wanted, that I wanted to live. But I'm of no use to you. Then it came over her more poignantly that she should not see him again. But she could not part with him that way. If you should send for me, I'd come. I shall keep that for my last pleasure, said Ralph. In answer to which she simply kissed him. It was a Thursday and that evening Caspar Goodwood came to Palazzo Rocanera. He was among the first to arrive, and he had intended to leave early, but he found no chance to speak with Isabel. There were several people at the end who seemed tethered to the carpet. Osmond had disappeared. He never bade goodbye to people. Isabel had sent Pansy to bed. She at last sat a little apart, and Caspar Goodwood presently approached her. May I talk to you? She got up immediately, smiling. I suppose you wish to bid me goodbye. Yes, but I don't like it. I don't want to leave Rome, he answered with almost plaintive honesty. I can well imagine, but it's wonderfully good of you. I don't care a straw for your cousin, Caspar suddenly broke out. Is that what you wish to tell me? No, I didn't want to tell you anything. I wanted to ask you, ask you, what have you really made of your life? He said in a low, quick tone. I can't understand. I can't penetrate you. What am I to believe? What do you want me to think? Isabel said nothing. She only stood looking at him. I'm told you're unhappy, and if you are, I should like to know it. That would be something for me. But you conceal everything. I haven't really come near you. You've come very near, Isabel said gently, but in a tone of warning. And yet I don't touch you. I want to know the truth. You ask a great deal. Yes, I've always asked a great deal. He sensed that this was his last chance, that he loved her and had lost her. When I tell you I love you, it's simply what I came for. I shouldn't say it if I didn't believe that I should never see you again. You've behaved so well. Don't spoil it, she uttered softly. No one hears me. 
I love you as I've never loved you. I know it. I ask nothing except one satisfaction, that you tell me, that I tell you what? Whether I may pity you. Should you like that? Isabel asked, trying to smile. To pity you? Most assuredly. I'd give my life to it. Isabel's eyes rested a moment on his. Don't give your life to it, but give a thought to it every now and then. And with that, she left him. When Madame Merle returned from Naples, shortly after Lord Warburton's departure, she called on Isabel and immediately inquired after this nobleman. Please don't talk of him, said Isabel. But don't you know I had set my heart on his marrying Pansy? Madame Merle insisted. Do you think it's too late? You had better ask Pansy. I shall ask her what you've said to her. Isabel perceived a critical tone in her visitor's attitude, and more clearly than ever before she heard a cold, mocking voice inside her declare that this bright, strong, worldly woman was a powerful agent in her destiny. As far as I'm concerned, it's all over, said Isabel. But perhaps you would like to discuss the matter with Osmond. I already have. He came to see me last evening, and he judges you very severely. Isabel made no answer to this. She felt choked with bitterness at the knowledge that Osmond dishonoured her in his words as well as in his thoughts. And for the first time since she had known her, Isabel thought Madame Merle disagreeable. But I haven't come to scold you, Madame Merle continued. I came, if possible, to learn the truth. What truth? Madame Merle sat looking at her friend, judging the effect of her words. It would make a great difference to your husband's view of his daughter's prospects to know distinctly what really occurred. If Lord Warburton simply got tired of the poor child, that's one thing. If he gave her up to please you, it's another. In that case, could you not resign yourself to not being pleased, to simply seeing your stepdaughter married? Let him off. Let us have him. Isabel grew pale. Who are you? What are you? What have you to do with my husband? Ah, oh, then, you take it heroically. I'm very sorry. Don't think, however, that I shall do so. What have you to do with me? Isabel went on. Madame Merle slowly got up. Everything. Isabel sat there, looking up at her. Her face was almost a prayer to be enlightened. But the light of this woman's eyes seemed only a darkness. Oh, misery, she murmured, covering her face with her hands. It had come over her like a high, surging wave that Mrs. Touchett was right. Madame Merle had married her. Before she uncovered her face again, that lady had left the room. On that same day in Madame Merle's apartment, Gilbert Osmond was seated, and his hostess stood before him. I don't believe you're unhappy, said Madame Merle. Did I say I was unhappy? Osmond answered gravely. I'm just very tired. And what about me? With you, it's just because you fatigue yourself. With me, it's not my own fault. When I fatigue myself, it's for you. I've given you an interest. You've never looked better. You've never been so agreeable, so brilliant. You express yourself more, too. I wish you would express yourself less, said Osmond sharply. I don't understand what's the matter with you. The matter? The matter? The matter is that I would give my right hand to be able to weep and that I can't. What good would it do you? It would make me feel as I felt before I knew you. 
I was vile this morning to Isabel. I was horrid. You've made me as bad as yourself. To what do you want to provoke me when you say such things? I've thought over all the harm you can do me, Madame Merle answered. Isabel was afraid of me this morning, but in me it was really you she feared. Isabel's not afraid of me. You always see too much in everything. Madame Merle stared at him. It's only since your marriage that I've understood you. Well, if you didn't understand me before I married, it was cruelly rash of you to put me into such a box. However, I took a fancy to the box myself. <laughs> I asked very little. I only asked that my wife should like me. That she should like you so much. That she should adore me, if you will. I never adored you, said Madame Merle. Ah, but you pretended to. But if my wife doesn't like me, at least my child does. If I had a child, Madame Merle said softly. Osmond paused. The children of others may be a great interest. There's something, after all, that holds us together, Gilbert. Is it the idea of the harm I may do you? No, it's the idea of the good I may do for you. It's that, Madame Merle pursued, that made me so jealous of Isabel. I want it to be my work. Her friend took up his hat. On the whole, I think you had better leave it to me. Have I been so vile all for nothing? Madame Merle wailed after he had left her. Edward Rosier had been absent from Rome for some weeks. Nobody had known where, not even Pansy, when Isabel received a letter from him in Paris. He wrote that he had sold all his china, furniture, and enamels and was in possession of $50,000. Now that I have money in my pocket, Mr. Osmond can't say I'm poor, he finished. But Isabel knew that Mr. Osmond would say he was not wise. She did not mention the letter to Pansy, but that evening before dinner she found Pansy waiting in her room. Pardon my taking the liberty, but it will be the last for some time. The child looked frightened. You're not going away. I'm going to the convent. Why? Pansy sighed. Because Papa thinks it best. It's only for a few weeks. Please come and see me. Isabel's answer to Pansy was a long, tender kiss. Isabel had forbidden herself ever to ask Osmond a question, so at dinner she simply said, I shall miss Pansy very much. I've always had the idea that one's daughter should be innocent and gentle. Convents are very quiet, very salutary. She'll have time to think, and there's something I want her to think about. 
Osmond spoke deliberately, reasonably. This struck a chill into Isabel's heart. It showed her just how far her husband was prepared to go. Pansy had taken fright. The impression her father desired to make would evidently be sharp enough. She would obey him. A week after this incident, Isabel received a telegram from England, from Mrs. Touchett. Ralph cannot last many days, it ran, and if convenient, would like to see you. Isabel went straight to her husband's study. Excuse me for disturbing you, she said, but Ralph's dying. Oh, I don't believe that, said Osmond, not looking round. He was dying when we married. He'll outlive us all. My aunt has telegraphed for me. I must go to Garden Court. Why? To see Ralph before he dies. I don't see the need of it. He came to see you here. I didn't like his being here in Rome, but I tolerated it because it was to be the last time you should see him. Now you tell me it's not to have been the last. I must go to England, Isabel declared. I shall not like it if you do. Why should I mind that? You like nothing I do or don't do. You pretend to think I lie. Osmond gave a cold smile. That's why you must go then? Not to see your cousin, but to take a revenge on me? I know nothing of revenge. I do. Don't give me an occasion and he turned back to his table. I suppose that if I go, you'll not expect me to come back, said Isabel. He turned quickly round and looked at her. Are you out of your mind? I really can't argue with you on the hypothesis of your defying me. Isabel quickly left the room. Her faculties, her energy, her passion were all dispersed. On her way back to her room, she met the Countess Gemini, you look very badly, said her sister-in-law. Will you let me comfort you? I know you're very unhappy. Yes, but I don't think you can help. Will you give me a try, said the countess, following Isabel into her sitting room and sitting down beside her. There's something I want you to know, she declared, because I think you ought to know it. Perhaps you've already guessed it. I've guessed nothing. I don't know what you mean. Isabel felt a foreboding. The countess stood up and stared at her. My first sister-in-law had no children. Your first sister-in-law? I suppose you know at least that Osmond has been married before. His first wife lived hardly three years and died childless. It wasn't until after her death that Pansy arrived. Isabel frowned. Pansy's not my husband's child, then. Your husband's in perfection, but someone else's wife. Oh, my good Isabel, cried the Countess. With you, one must dot one's eyes. The lady in question was separated from her husband so the child could never pass as hers. The conditions happened to make it workable that Osmond should acknowledge the little girl. His wife was dead, very true, but she had not been dead too long. He told the story of his wife having died in childbirth and of his having in grief and horror banished the child for as long as possible to a nurse. The story passed sufficiently. His wife had died with her family in Piedmont. But of course I knew, although I'd never spoken of it before. It was enough for me that the child was my niece. As for her veritable mother... The Countess had spoken no name, yet Isabel could but check on her own lips an echo of the unspoken. Why have you told me this? Because I've been so bored with your not knowing. Had it never occurred to you that Osmond was for six or seven years Madame Merle's lover? I don't know. Things have occurred to me. And perhaps that was what they all meant. Isabel was silent a little. Why then did she want him to marry me? Oh, my dear, that's her superiority. 
You had money. She believed you would be good to Pansy. You've been made use of. Isabel made no answer to this. She only listened, and the Countess went on. They've always been bound to each other. When their little carnival was over, they made a bargain that each should do everything possible to help the other on. I know this by the way they've behaved. Now, see how much better women are than men. She has found a wife for Osmond. She has worked for him, plotted for him, suffered for him. And the end of it is that he's tired of her. There are moments when he needs her, but on the whole, he wouldn't miss her if she were removed. And what's more, today she knows it. So you needn't be jealous, the Countess added humorously, laying her hand on Isabel's arm. Will you still give up your journey? There was a train for Paris that evening, and after the Countess had left her, Isabel had a rapid and decisive conference with her maid, who was discreet and devoted. After this, she drove to the convent to see Pansy. She was admitted to the parlour while the portress went to make it known that there was a visitor for the young lady. The portress shortly returned, ushering in another person. Isabel found herself confronted by Madame Merle. Isabel did not speak. You're surprised to find me here, and I'm afraid you're not pleased. I ought to have asked your permission. This was said simply and mildly. There was none of the oblique movement of irony. Madame Merle continued. I came to see Pansy because I thought she must be rather lonely. Of course it's none of my business, but I feel happier since... There was a sudden break in her voice a lapse in her continuity. Madame Merle had guessed in the space of an instant that everything was at an end between herself and her listener, and she had guessed the reason why. The person who stood there was not the same one she had seen hitherto, but a very different person, a person who knew her secret. I had better go to Pansy. I've come to say goodbye, our young woman said at last. I go to England tonight. Ralph Touchett is dying. Ah, you'll feel that, said Madame Merle, recovering herself. But Isabel turned and left the room. Outside she met Sister Catherine, who showed her up a long staircase to Pansy's room. Isabel scarcely knew what she could say to her. I've come to bid you goodbye, she said eventually. I'm going to England. To England? Mr. Touchett is very ill. I wish to see him. Oh, yes, of course you must go. But, but don't leave me here. Isabel's heart beat fast. Will you come away with me now? Pansy looked at her pleadingly. Did Papa tell you to bring me? No. I think I had better wait, then. Papa wished me to think a little, and I've thought a great deal. What have you thought? Well, that I must never displease Papa. You knew that before. Yes, but I know it better. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Then, as she heard her own words, a deep, pure blush came into her face. Isabel read the meaning of it. The poor girl had been vanquished. Isabel's time was rapidly shortening. Goodbye, then, Pansy. I leave Rome tonight, but I won't desert you. Then they held each other a moment in a silent embrace. Madame Merle has been here, Pansy remarked as Isabel stood at the top of the stairs. I don't like Madame Merle. Isabel hesitated. You must never say that, that you don't like Madame Merle. Pansy looked at her in wonder. I never will again, then. But you'll come back? Yes, I'll come back.
As Isabel left the convent, she found Madame Merle waiting. This lady was now in full possession of her resources. I wanted to ask you something about poor Mr. Touchett. Are you very fond of him? Yes, I'm very fond of him, Isabel replied. But I don't understand you. Well, I have an idea that your cousin once did you a great service. He has done me many services. Yes, but one was much above the rest. He made you a rich woman. It's him you have to thank for your brilliant marriage, said Madame Merle triumphantly. It was my uncle's money, but it was your cousin's idea. Isabel stood staring. What do you know? Only what I've guessed. Then Isabel said it was her only revenge. I believed it was you I had to thank. Madame Merle stood there in a kind of proud penance. You're very unhappy, I know, but I'm more so. Yes, I can believe that. I think I should like never to see you again. I shall go to America, Madame Merle said quietly and walked away. It was with a feeling which in other circumstances would have had much of the effect of joy that as Isabel descended from the Paris mail at Charing Cross, she stepped into the arms of Henrietta Stackpole. She had telegraphed her friend from Turin. Henrietta was waiting with Mr. Bantling. This gallant bachelor advanced with a smile, a smile tempered, however, by the gravity of the occasion. He told Isabel that he had just come from Garden Court. How is my dear cousin? Poor Ralph is in bed and looks tremendously ill and he can't speak. But he was awfully jolly and funny all the same. It's very wretched. Even in the crowded station, Isabel found this simple picture was vivid. Henrietta had arranged that Isabel should stay in London with her overnight and catch the early train from Paddington the next morning. And later, in a dusty parlour in Wimpole Street, the friend sat talking. Did your husband make a scene about your leaving? Henrietta asked. Well, it wasn't what you call a scene. What was it then? I'm tired, Henrietta. Let's not speak of it now. We've so little time. Tell me your adventures. Well, I've been to stay with Lady Pencil. Ah, oh, the invitation came at last. Yes. But this time, she wanted to see me. Henrietta blushed and stared at her friend. Isabel Archer, I beg your pardon. I criticized you once, and yet I've gone further than you. Mr. Osmond at least was born in America. Henrietta, are you going to give up your country? Yes, I am. I'm going to marry Mr. Bantling and live in London. Well... I'm very happy for you, 
said Isabel, smiling. But later, as she lay in bed, she felt a certain melancholy that Henrietta, whom she had hitherto regarded as a keen flame, a disembodied voice, should after all have confessed herself human and feminine. Isabel arrived at Garden Court the following morning. She had left Wimpole Street early, and her only desire was to reach her much-embracing refuge. Garden Court had been her starting point, and to those muffled chambers it was at least a temporary solution to return. Mrs. Touchett looked a great deal older as she greeted her. She had been sitting with Ralph for several hours. How is he? Isabel asked. He's asleep most of the time. You can see him later on. Is there really no hope? None whatever. There never has been. It has not been a successful life. No, it has only been a beautiful one. I don't know what you mean by that. There's no beauty without health, said Mrs. Touchett abruptly. By the way, Lord Warburton's been to see Ralph and told him he's engaged to be married. To be married? Who's the young lady? Oh, some member of the aristocracy. I'm very glad. It must be a sudden decision. Sudden enough, I believe. A courtship of three weeks. I'm very glad. Isabel repeated with a larger emphasis. Mrs. Touchett was watching her. Have you ever been sorry you didn't marry Lord Warburton? Isabel smiled. No, dear aunt. Well, I suppose I'll have to believe you, but it's beyond me. Do you still like Serena Merle? She went on. Not as I once did. She's going to America. To America? She must have done something very bad. Yes, very bad. May I ask what it is? She made a convenience of me. Ah, cried Mrs. Touchett. So she did of me. It was not till the evening that Isabel was able to see Ralph. He had opened his eyes and recognized her as she sat by his bedside. But he was unable to speak. There was a strange tranquility on his face. On the evening of the third day, however, he spoke at last. They were alone. I feel better tonight, he murmured. Don't people always feel better just before the end? Isabel sank down on her knees beside his pillow and sobbed. Oh, what is it you have done for me? He groaned. What is it you did for me? She cried. She had lost all her shame. Now she wished him to know, for it brought them supremely together. You did something once. You know it. Is it true that you made me rich? That all I have is yours? Oh, don't speak of that. That was not happy. I believe I ruined you, he wailed. She was full of the sense that he was beyond the reach of pain. She wished to say everything. She was afraid he might die before she had done so. He married me for my money, she said. I always tried to keep that from you. She pressed her lips to the back of his hand. I always understood. Is, is it all over between you? Oh, no. I don't think anything's over. Are you going back to him? Ralph gasped. I don't know. I can't think of anything but you for the moment. Here, with you dying in my arms, I'm happier than I've been for a long time. And I want you to be happy and feel that I'm near you and I love you. Ralph evidently found greater difficulty in speaking. I'm very tired. I wish I could stay. For me, you'll always be here. Oh, Ralph. Remember this, that 
If you've been hated, you've also been loved. Oh, but Isabel... Adored. He just audibly and lingeringly breathed. Ralph Touchett died peacefully in his sleep that night. When Isabel went to pay her respects the following morning, the person she saw on the bed was fairer than Ralph had ever been in life, and there was a strange resemblance to the face of his father. A surprising number of people attended the funeral three days later. Through her tear-filled eyes, Isabel noticed Caspar Goodwood. She had not realized he was still in England. She was aware of him staring at her, but he did not speak, and at the end of the service, he disappeared. Isabel made no immediate motion to leave Garden Court. She was happy to stay with her aunt for a while. Her errand was over. She had done what she had left her husband to do. She lived from day to day, postponing, trying not to think. She knew she must decide. Her coming itself had not been a decision. One afternoon, when Isabel was wandering alone in the garden, she saw Mrs. Touchett coming towards her, accompanied by Lord Warburton. He looked extremely self-conscious. Lord Warburton has called to see me, said Mrs. Touchett. He didn't know you were still here. I'm catching the train for London at 6.30, Mrs. Touchett's companion explained. I'm so glad to find you've not gone. Mrs. Touchett turned discreetly away. My sisters would have come if they had known you were still here, Lord Warburton went on. It would have given me great pleasure to see them. I don't know whether you could come to Lockley for a day or two. You know there's always that old promise. And his lordship coloured as he made this suggestion. Thank you extremely. I have your promise, then? There was an interrogation in this, but Isabel let it pass. Take care you don't miss your train. And then she added, I wish you every happiness. He blushed again and looked at his watch. Yes, I must go. I haven't much time. He said a very hurried goodbye, and in a moment the two ladies saw him striding across the lawn. Are you sure he's to be married? Isabel asked her aunt. Well, I congratulated him, and he accepted it. Oh, said Isabel. <laughs> I give up. Mrs. Touchett returned to the house, but Isabel sat on the bench and watched the sun go down. How long she sat there, she did not know. But the twilight had become thick when she suddenly realized she was not alone. Looking up, she saw Caspar Goodwood a few yards off, standing staring at her. He started forward and sat beside her on the bench. Oh, you frightened me, she said. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I waited for Lord Warburton to leave. I want to speak to you. Goodwood spoke very fast. I came here from London today to help you. Help me? Your cousin Ralph Touchett. He was a good man, a fine man, one of the best. He guessed my sentiments. He explained everything on our journey home. Do you know what he said to me the last time I saw him? He said, do everything you can for her. Do everything she'll let you. Isabel suddenly got up. You had no business to talk about me. But even if Touchett had never opened his mouth, I should have known. You can't deceive me any more. You're the most unhappy of women. And your husband's the deadliest of fiends. Are you mad? She cried. I've never been so sane. I see the whole thing. You're afraid to go back. You don't know which way to turn. I want you, therefore, to turn to me. Turn to you? Goodwood stared at her with his eyes shining. Why shouldn't we be happy when it's so easy? I'm yours forever, forever and ever. You must save what you can of your life. You took the great step in coming away. The next is nothing. It's the natural one. We can do exactly as we please. Trust me. 
Isabel gave a long murmur, like a creature in pain. Do me the greatest kindness of all, she panted. I beseech you to go away. Oh, don't say that. Don't kill me. Her eyes were streaming with tears. As you love me, as you pity me, leave me alone. He glared at her a moment. And then the next instant she felt his arms about her and his lips on hers. His kiss was like white lightning, a flash that spread and stayed. And it was extraordinarily as if, while she took it, she felt everything about him that at least pleased her, each aggressive fact of his face, his figure, his presence, justified of its intense identity and made one with this act of possession. So had she heard of those wrecked and underwater, following a train of images before they sink. But when darkness returned, she was free. She never looked about her. She only darted from the spot and ran back toward the house. Only then did she pause. She had not known where to turn, but she knew now there was a very straight path. Two days afterwards, Caspar Goodwood knocked at the door of Henrietta Stackpole's lodgings in Wimpole Street. Henrietta was just going out. I've come to see Mrs. Osmond, he said. They told me at Garden Court she was coming here. But she came yesterday, Mr. Goodwood. This morning she started for Rome. Caspar Goodwood stood staring at the floor. Oh, she started... Henrietta grasped his arm. Look here, Mr. Goodwood. Just you wait. On which he looked up at her, but only to guess from her face with revulsion that she simply meant he was too young. She stood shining at him with that cheap comfort, and it added on the spot thirty years to his life. She walked him away with her, however, as if she had given him now the key to patience.